Hello and welcome. Uh, we're going to give everyone one more minute and then get started, but we're so glad you're here. Nice to see so many faces. <clears throat> Welcome, welcome. Give us till one minute after the hour and then we'll get started. Oh, there we have it. All right, I see a couple more people joining. Well, hello and welcome and happy early Passover. My name is Lisa Apfelberg and I'm so excited to welcome you on behalf of Jewish Fedge and the Jewish Initiative for Animals to our Zader Hader. And in case you aren't aware, the word Hader means a traditional place of learning and study in both Yiddish and Hebrew. Our organizations are thrilled to partner with each other because of our joint efforts in advocating for a more ethical, humane, and sustainable food future in the Jewish community. Please take a moment to introduce yourself in the chat and let us know where you're joining us from today. I'm going to turn it over to Rabbi Jonathan Bernhard, who is going to MC our learning together, but first I'm going to introduce him. Based in Los Angeles, Jonathan is an ordained conservative rabbi who served a wonderful congregation for 25 years before it was deciding it was time for something different. In addition to serving all animals, Jonathan is the co-founder of Valley Hevra Kadisha and is crazy about English Premier League soccer, fostering mama dogs and their puppies, raising chickens, chickens and playing ukulele very badly. And recently, he's become very interested in green burial, burials as well. Uh, Jonathan, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome, everyone. It's terrific to be able to, to be here and share some, some Passover learning with everybody. Um, as Lisa mentioned, my name is Jonathan Bernhard. Um, I go with he, him pronouns. Um, and my role in, in Jewish Initiative for Animals is I, I am the executive director and get to work with these wonderful team of people. Um, as we join together for this learning, um, I do always like to begin our learning with a blessing for Torah study. Um, the blessing, in pe for people who don't know, goes, Asher ki tshana b'mitzvot tov v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. And so I want to invite everyone to join together um, and, and, and say the blessing or just say amen or just take a moment and just kind of set an intention for yourself to separate yourself out from whatever's been going on as we get ready to, to do some, some learning that will hopefully Elevate our souls and elevate our satyrs as well. Please join with me. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Awalam, Asher Kitshana Bamitsota Vitsivanu La Asok Bidivre Torah. We acknowledge you, God, as a source of all life and grateful for opportunities to come together to learn, to grow, to study, and ideally to become better and more kind people in a world that so badly needs it. Amen. Okay, so my friends, uh, we're going to be diving into our learning right away because we have about, ooh, 53 minutes together to be able to open up the Seder plate and hopefully, 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 encourage all of you to come away with a very different understanding of what your Seder plates can be. So with that having been said, let me just go to the share screen. See how this works. So are you all able to see my screen? Have I shared successfully? Woohoo! Okay. Technological hurdle number one for the day overcome. Let's see how the rest goes. Um, as, um, as you see here, the, the title for our talk this morning is From Beats to Bones to Question Mark. Um, and the question mark is basically this. At the end of our learning together, my hope is that you will be able to look at the items on your Seder plate in a very different way, and that you will ultimately decide for yourself what is going to be that item on the plate that you want to have. Um, and let's see if I can convince everyone that this is the case, or should be the case. Um, a sec. First technical problem is I can't get my screen to move. Hold on. Sorry about that. Okay. Did the screen shift? Yes? We can see your second slide, Jonathan. You're good. 
Great. Oh, just wanted to check. Okay, so this, this slide, just before we begin, I just want to say is titled, One Who Quotes in the Name of Others Hastens the Arrival of the Messiah. So I want to be very clear here. Um, the material that I'm about to share with you, um, the stuff that is good, the stuff that you love, the, the stuff that you're like, oh my God, that's amazing. I didn't come up with it. Right. I am basing my work and sharing the sources I'm primarily sharing with you come from a brilliant colleague of mine and a brilliant article he wrote. His name is Rabbi Josh Culp. Um, I have put the um, the link here in the slide. We will be sending all of this information out to everyone afterwards, so you don't have to worry about it. But I did just want to share that because it is a great article, and I encourage everyone after this, hopefully, 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 this entire talk is really just going to be a motivation to study and to read his article, um, and also the article from uh, a Jewish My Jewish Learning, which is also terrific. So let us jump in. When we think about the Seder plate... Hey, Jonathan. Right, when we're getting... Jonathan, yeah. can you make it full screen again? Put sure. It in, put it in slideshow mode again, so everyone can see. Thank you. No problem. I just got to figure out how, when it's in full screen mode, that I can actually shift the slide. But I'll work that out. Anyway, when we think about the Passover and we go to the Seder plate, we begin getting ready for the Seder plate. I just want to point out something and put something out there. I struggle every year to remember exactly what's on the Seder plate. I'm an ordained rabbi and I've been doing this for many years. So I just want to share that confession. I just want to be real honest about this. Every year I'm like, okay, yeah, there's this thrower, there's this, this, this. And, and, and it's always, by the way, Hazaret that throws me, right? Because I'm never like, oh yeah, what exactly is Hazaret? And then I have to go and study all the sources to remind myself exactly where Hazaret comes from. Because the idea of just additional misery on the Seder plate is just, I don't know. I think we can do better than that sometimes with Hazaret. So each year I go back and I remind myself what's on the Seder plate, on the traditional Seder plate. And so what do we have? We have Zroa, which is the shank bone. We have Hazaret, which is this extra marvor. We have marvor, which is the bitter herb. We have karpas, which is some green thing right? Often parsley, depending on your custom. Um, and we have haroset. We have that, that wonderful sweet mix of nuts and, and dates um, to make this kind of paste. Um, and of course, we have in the middle, but it's not really necessarily part of the Seder plate, is the matzah. So we have these different items. And I want to show you the Seder plate that my wife and I now use. I'm just in the process of opening all my Passover stuff, so I don't have all of it. Can people see this, or do I have to unshare my screen? Right. So you'll notice, by the way, it's not it, it's missing the cups that go here because I haven't finished my, my Seder unpacking. But if they saw the cups, it would just be clear cups. It doesn't say what the item should be. And that makes it, to my mind, the best of saving plates, because what I'm going to try to show as we dive into these sources is that our idea of what's on the traditional Seder plate is something that evolved over time. And my encouragement to all of us is that we keep that evolution going. So let's begin and let's ask ourselves, what did this original Seder plate look like? Is it possible to answer that question? To which the answer is yes. We know exactly what the traditional or the original Seder plate looked like because in chapter 10 of a section of rabbinic work called the Mishnah, which basically covers rabbinic conversations from about 100 before the Common Era, to about 200 of the common era. In this tractate, in the 10th chapter of, of the Mishnayot, of the Mishnahs called Psachim, of dealing with Passover, is in fact a description of the traditional Seder from beginning to end. The entire chapter is, this is the way the Seder used to be. Um, by the way, very simple read, very straightforward, and I encourage people to um, take an opportunity. You, the English is, 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 is fairly accessible. It gives you a sense of what it was like. And here's what they say. At the, about the beginning of the Seder. They say they brought before him matzah and chazeret and haroset and at least two cooked dishes in honor of the festival. The Tana, which is the author of the Mishnah, comments that this was the practice, although eating haroset is not a mitzvah, but merely a custom. Rabbi Eliezer ben Sadok says, actually it is a mitzvah to eat chazeret, haroset, and in the period when the temple stood, they offered the Paschal lamb. They brought him the body of the Paschal lamb. Okay, so what is this describing? Is This is describing what the Seder would look like going back 2,000 years. 
both at a time when the temple existed and then a time when the temple did not exist. And in that period of time, people would gather and a plate would be put in front of the person, the person who is leading the Seder and each individual person would also have their plate. And on the plate that was put in front of people, you would have matzah, hazeret, haroset. And there's a question at that time as to whether haroset is a mitzvah, which is to say it's an obligation or a custom, right? And there used to be before the temple, they would actually, when the Paschal lamb was offered as a sacrifice, these would ga these gatherings would take place all around Jerusalem and all around the city. And so people would get a little piece of that Paschal offering as part of their meal when the temple existed. And what else did it have? It had two cooked dishes. And this is going to be our focus because it's these two cooked dishes that eventually would come the egg and the shank bone. And so it says these two cooked dishes in honor of the festival. So let me first ask the following question. And here what I'm going to invite people to do is I'm going to invite you to unmute yourself. If you want to answer, you can pop up your hand. You can just unmute yourself and call out the answer and we'll see how chaotic it gets, if at all. Um, and, um, and we'll go from there. But when it talks about two cooked dishes, why do you think you had to have two cooked dishes? Right here it says in honor of the festival, but what do you think that actually means? I want to open it up and just see if any people have any thoughts. And by the way, one other thing I want to put out there is where else do you see a doubling of food? You see it for Shabbos. Right. Right. So one of the things to kind of keep in mind is the whole doubling, the whole two dishes thing. OK, not entirely out there. Now, with Shabbos, right, it's tied very much to the notion of we're not able to prepare the meal over the course of the day because it's Shabbos. And this reminds us of the two portions of manna, right, that the Israelites would gather when they were in the wilderness. OK. By the way, and having two, right, and you put the two together on your Shabbos plate is a way of reflecting what about the day? Aren't we supposed right. to have, I'm sorry, aren't we supposed to have an extra soul on Shabbat? So maybe that's also part of it, the doubling of the holiness as well. Absolutely. All that doubling, right, the doubling of the soul, the doubling portion, all of it points to a certain sense of joy and uplift and elevation about the day, right? The doubling means like, wow, this is special, right? And that, by the way, is one of the reasons that's offered as to why it is you have two cooked dishes, right? Because it's a special day. Every festival should have extra, have two cooked dishes, in the same way, by the way, that every holiday has additional sacrifices that were offered at the temple. Now, I know within this particular group, talking about sacrifices offered at the temple, not necessarily our favorite subject, right? And we're not praying for its return either. But we can use it as a way of showing the values that were reflected and how they experienced certain things. And festivals were times of joy. They were times of simcha. And so that sense of joy was reflected in the food and in the plentiness of the food and therefore in the doubling of the food, right? So one of the reasons that we know that two cooked dishes were there is that it, it, it's reflective of the joy of the festival. And by the way, here's the other thing I want to point out. They ate that food, right? 2,000 years ago, the Seder plate was not what it is for us. It's not symbolic yet. It's a plate, you know, a real plate where they put the food down for their meal. This is what they were eating on Passover night, right? So this food would be put in front of them and they would sit and they would eat this food. Now, let's start having a little bit, let's start going into a little bit more detail and let's just ask ourselves, okay, well, what, what exactly were the foods that were eaten? Uh, what were those plates? Hold on, just got to go, oops. <laughs> there we go. Jonathan, if you're in slideshow mode, you should be able to use your arrows to forward to the next slide. You know, that's what I thought too, but it wasn't working. So oh, gotcha. I'll give it another try because, because with my luck, I hit the wrong arrow, but we'll try again. Um, anyway, so let's get down to what these two cooked dishes are, because this is going to give us our first insight as to why beets are ever even spoken about on Passover. So. 
according to the rabbis, going back, they looked at this text, this, this Mishnah, and they said to themselves as well, what two cooked dishes are we speaking about here? And this is the first answer that's given. This is given by a rabbi by the name of Rav Huna. Uh, Rav Huna lived in around 2000 of the common era, a very, very important rabbi of his day. And his answer was, what are the two cooked dishes? Beets and rice. Beets and rice were the two cooked dishes. So let's note two things about this dish. First, what is missing from this dish that should make us happy? No this animal. would be the interactive part. No animal products. Meat. Right, there we go. Right, no animal product. Here's your beet, right? Here is where, this is where the whole idea of using a beet on a Seder plate comes from. It comes from here. So first, no animal product. But beyond that, which is, which is the first thing that we might notice, but beyond that, what do you notice about beets and rice as a meal? How expensive do you think this one was? Yeah. Right. Very cheap. Exactly. Exactly. And here, there are there. This is not an accident. This is a theme in rabbinic literature, and this is one of the reasons that, among all the disparate and desperate groups that were out there at this time, that were vying for the people's love and attention and loyalty. Here's one of the reasons why the rabbis, in a sense, won this particular debate, because they set beets and rice because it's not expensive, because it is affordable for everybody. Right? So if you want to celebrate the holiday, if you want to fulfill the holiday, what do you need? You know, if you start setting these higher and higher expectations of these different things, it starts putting the holiday and making it feel somehow out of reach to people. That is absolutely contrary to the rabbinic spirit. The rabbinic spirit is to make things accessible to people. And so when it says two cooked dishes, Rav Huna knew exactly what he was doing when he said beets and rice, right? Doesn't necessarily mean that that's what he would eat, but that's what it could be. And by the way, it is suspected that that is what he ate. Um, but the important element here that I don't want us to lose is that sense of accessibility. And Rava, his student, would seek out beets and rice for his meal on Passover night since this ruling came from Rav Huna's mouth. And Rava was a student of Rav Huna's. And so here we see the custom going on from the next generation. But note, it is just this custom. It is this one rabbi's take on it. Oh, gosh, Lisa, that worked. Thank you. Hey, that arrow key. Okay, so I may have been hitting the wrong arrow. Okay, I had <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan. my strong point. Yeah. Sorry. Um, oh, I just had a thought about the uh, beets and rice in that it's very inexpensive and very easy to prepare. So for those who were not of the upper classes, this suits everybody. Absolutely. Absolutely right. Um, and, and, and that really and that really was the idea. And by the way, just because it happens to be another side passion of mine, by the way, another area where people would see this explicitly, just so you know, it really is a theme, came with burials. Uh, there's a very, very famous mission, a very famous uh, rabbinic statement from the same period of time that talks about how burials have to be done. And it, it specifically addresses people not wanting to embarrass people because their funeral wasn't as fine and their, their the, the carriage to the, the grave wasn't as, as as beautiful. So the rabbi simplified everything again to make everything more accessible and 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 open to people. Again, it's part of it and it's part of it's part of why it is they were seen as being of the people and part of the people. Um, so um, any uh, any other questions about those first that that first two cooked dishes? So we see beets and rice is first named. We see the student continuing it. But, you know, just so you know, because we're Jews, we're going to argue about it now. Um, but before we get to the argument, any other comments or anything that people just want to note about it? Terrific. So we, we continue. So on the next slide here, I just want to show how the evolution of the two cooked dishes begins and where we see, even though it's very subtle, where we see the beginning of the evolution from a cooked dish that people would eat to a symbolic dish. So here we go. Hiskia, 
here's another rabbi, and this is just a lot of how the rabbinic conversations go, which is one rabbi said this, then this, then this, then this. What I did here, however, is I want to share with you in parentheses are the suspected dates of their, if not their lifetime, their teaching times of these of these next three rabbis. And I want you just to note how the conversation begins with a rabbi who could have lived in 200 of the common era. And this conversation ends with someone who possibly was living and teaching by 425 of the common era. Right? Because that's the nature of Talmud, which is it's not just a conversation between different parties. It's a conversation between different parties over the course of time. So it becomes a layered conversation. So one generation, they were going with Rav Huna. And Rav Huna's idea of two cooked dishes was beets and rice. Hiskia comes over and he's the next generation. And he said the, cook, cook, the two cooked dishes can even be fish and the egg that was fried on it. Right? So lest you think that it has to be this, Right, he comes along and says, "No, no, no. This is this is good. This is fine. This is what it can be. But if you want, you can have two dishes. And by the way, the idea of the fish and the egg that was fried on it was because that was a dish. And so the question that the rabbis were settling here was, if you have a dish where you actually have two different kinds of things combined, does that count as one dish or does that count as two? Right, because if it counts as one dish." His kia would come along and say to that person, you know, you really need to eat another cooked dish because this is a festival. Come on, come on, where's the joy? Then we get to, oh, um, then, then we're going to skip. I just want to skip to Ravina, to the one on the bottom. Um, he said, for the two cooked foods, one may even use meat and the bone, uh, meat on the bone and the gravy in which it was cooked. So once again, they're basically saying, how far do you go with this cooked dish? Oh, well, it could be just the bone and the broth. The gravy itself could count as a second dish. Okay? So they're focused on the fact that you can have two cooked dishes. They're focused on the different range of what counts as two cooked dishes. And again, remind everyone, these are not symbolic foods. This was their Passover meal. But in between these two rabbis, we have this one guy named Rav Yosef who lived from, as it says, 290 to, to 320. <laughs> and um, he lived, um, he was a rabbi who lived in what would be considered today a modern day, um, modern day Iraq. Um, he, was from the, he was from the Babylonian Jewish community. And he said, one requires two types of meat on Passover night, one in remembrance of the Paschal lamb and one in remembrance of the festival peace offering, which was also eaten on Passover night. Okay, so note the shift here, right? What he is saying is, first, you, yeah, two cooked dishes, but he believes that those two cooked dishes have to be two types of meat. And he says one in remembrance of the Paschal lamb, right? Or, um, and the other in, in, in remembrance of the peace offering. Both of these were meat offerings. These were animal sacrifices. And so he's basically saying, I want those two cooked dishes to be closer to what the temple, what was offered at the temple rather than just anything. And there's speculation as to why he may have wanted this, but no one knows why. But this is the shift that will open up the door for the creation of our Seder plates as we experience it now. Right. And by the way, I want to point out something. You're still eating it. This is still the Passover dish. This is not symbolic yet. He wants it to be a meat dish in remembrance of, but he wants people to eat it. Um, and by the way, in terms of speculation, I would just point out um, the, the two things, which is we are now over 100 years after the destruction of the temple. So the idea of holding on in memory becomes really important. Right? And I think we all understand that when we lose significant things, we look for ways to incorporate those memories into our lives, be it on our Seder plates or just on, in, in our homes, in our daily lives when we lose people who we love, right? So we can understand the psychology here. The other thing is I'd point out, it's not only a hundred over a hundred years since the destruction of the temple, um, but he's living in Babylon. He lives far away. He's not in the land of Israel, right? So I think that that desire for that connection might even be all the stronger. 
when you're out and that desire of trying to remember and hold on to. And I just want to share that that idea of bringing in elements to our ritual lives that reflect the temple as a way of maintaining a connection is a really time-honored rabbinic custom. Uh, most famously, uh, salt on Friday night on the hala. Right? I mean, I don't know about you, but when I go to a restaurant and they bring me bread, I don't say, golly, where's the salt? I, <laughs> that's just not... That's not how I generally eat bread here, folks. Um, and, um, and, and and I suspect many here might not. You know, I do like a little olive oil with vinegar, you know, a little vinegar stuff. I do, oh, that's great. But salt, no, that is a reflection of the salt that was put on the sacrifices when they were being offered because the table is meant to be, and the home is meant to be a mikdash ma'at, a mini sanctuary. So that is but one way in which we hold on to a connection to the temple in a, in a ritual that we perform. So what Rav Yosef is doing here is perfectly par for the course. But as I said, still still being eaten, not symbolic yet. That's going to come a few hundred years later. But before we make that shift, I just want to touch base. Um, any, any questions or anything that people want to go over? So far, so good? Okay. So how do we go? When does it actually happen that the food on the Seder plate stops becoming a Seder plate and becomes more like a Seder symbolic plate? Here's the key move for both how we get to the egg and how we get to the bone. So it would happen, and this is this is how the Passover meal is being described by a rabbi who lived in, it's a little bit rough here, but it's between like the 13th and 14th centuries in France. Um, and this is Rabbi Aaron ben um, Yaakov, who wrote a very famous book called Orhot Hayim, which, um, uh, let's see, Paths of Light, or light Paths of, uh, paths of Life. Um, and what this book captures is at this time, it captures the predominant Ashkenazic customs of this region, right? To what extent they were widespread is always an argument, but this is the way Ashkenazic Jews were kind of doing their Jew at this time. And this is how he talks about Passover. He says, and afterwards they bring in front of him a basket with three guarded matzot, right? Just the same way we have our three matzot. Right, so we can see sort of how some of these traditions get in there and just have lasted literally thousands of years. Celery or some vegetable and lettuce for maror and two cooked dishes, one roasted and one boiled. The roasted one in memory of Pesach and the boiled one in memory of the Chagiga. So let's just stop there for a second because there probably could be a few questions. <clears throat> so first, Karpas. Celery or some other vegetable. What do we use as carpas on our Seder plates for the most part? I'm curious, what are, what are people's customs? Parsley. Parsley, anyone, any, anyone, else have par, or anyone else have something different than parsley? Some people in our community use potato. Ah, yes, the good Russians in your community. Oh, yes. <laughs> Anyone, you know, like like a chunk of people from from you know from 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 from, from the kind of the eastern settlements and so forth in Russia and so all those countries, potatoes come up a lot. <laughs> celery. Um, anyone, I'm sorry. Celery. I think. I, okay, so I, Mindy I has celery. celery. So Mindy, did you grow up with celery? By the way, I'm just curious. No, I grew up with parsley, but I was at a seder where they use celery. All right. Okay, so let's just talk about that one for a little sec here, right? Just as we start breaking open the Seder plate. So a lot of us use parsley. And once again, I want to ask you just like the salt, how many of you go to a restaurant and say to yourselves, golly, you know what? Could you please give me a plate of parsley so I can dip it in some salt water, please? All right. Okay. So this is where you know the food has come symbolic, really symbolic because now we're talking about food we generally don't eat, which is contrary, again, so contrary to the way the Seder plate was understood, right? It wasn't all symbolic. It was meant to be consumed, right? So here, they didn't use parsley. The parsley is meant to represent what in this case? 
What's our parsley for? Spring growth. Exactly, like spring growth and so forth. And, and the key element therefore is that it is green and that it is a vegetable, right? So that you can say the blessing over it. But here's the thing, friends. Anything that fits which literally means creator of the fruit of the earth is actually okay for karpas. Because do you know what another word for karpas is? Or d'oeuvres. Right? So... Yes, here, look, these, these, these French Jews, I mean, come on, you're going to talk about food, who's going to do it right? It's going to be the French Jews, right? So these French Jews, I understand, Carpas, this is meant to be eaten, so they eat celery. It's the greenness, they choose green, I, you know, I'm assuming just because of spring and so forth. Other places did not have green vegetables at this time of year, notably the Jews living in the pale of the settlement, which is why you had potatoes, right? Also, or <laughs> Also, horseradish and what radishes. Thank you. Um, I mean, they're my people too, but I, what we brought cuisine-wise, it lacks a little. So, so we have the carpas. We have lettuce for maror. By the way, here's another thing I want to point out, right? Maror, that bitter herb, rad, that, that horseradish, that's an Eastern European Jewish thing because they didn't have access to other things at that time. Lettuce, particularly romaine lettuce, is considered to be appropriate for maror because I want to remind you all, maror means bitter. It doesn't mean disgusting, right? Now, this is a personal thing, so I, I apologize for people who I've offended who are into horseradish. I know there are some people out there. I, 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 wanna, I just wanna say, I love you. I don't understand you, right? Romaine lettuce is perfectly acceptable because the, especially the the the... The, 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 the stem, spine of it is bitter, right? And because and, and, the taste is meant to be a bitter taste. And by the way, this would mean, but as you see like, oh, you mean I don't have to use horseradish, they used to use romaine lettuce. Oh, I actually don't even need to use romaine lettuce. I need to use something that is bitter, right? So as we start opening up and we see the ev evolution of different symbols on the Seder plate, we realize our Seder plate can be something different. Now let's just get back to our main topic here, which is it then talks about two cooked dishes. And again, they are eating these dishes. One in memory of the Chagiga, one in memory of the Pas Pas Passover offering, same as Rav Yosef. And they boiled one made of egg in memory of mourning over the temple. This, my friends, is where it is believed the egg is primarily introduced in Ashkenazi communities. There are other examples, by the way, of eggs being used earlier, but never in this connection, right? And never with this connection necessarily being so explicit. But here again, I encourage people to go to Rabbi Kolb's ar article and he'll give a little bit more detail and nuance. But this is, this is the primary place where we see the shift um, to egg because it says boiled because the first sacrifice, the Passover sacrifice, was roasted. The second Passover sacrifice, the Chagiga, the festival offering, was boiled. And so again, as they're trying to maintain a proximity, the food mirrors how the sacrifices were presented. And it was boiled. And so over time, it became accustomed to use the egg because here we're remembering not only the festival offering, but we're also remembering the destruction of the temple. And I would also point out that this is classic of Ashkenaz, of not only Ashkenazic Jewry, but French Jewry of this time. I just want to point out to you that the custom of reciting the mourner's Kaddish in the way that we do it in our communities nowadays is believed to have come from these French communities after they experienced the Crusades. These communities became very focused on mourning and mourning practices. And a number of our mourning practices come from this, these communities during this period of time when they experienced the Crusades. Roughly speaking, in this case, it would have been 11th and 12th century is when, we would see, is when Crusaders went through Europe on their way to the Holy Land. Um, and they decimated these communities. So just, just a little bit of a historical context for why they might be focusing on mourning practices, very, very much part of the community. Um, and we see now, it's now, by the way, I just want to point out, the egg was still being eaten at this point in time. This is still two cooked dishes. This is still a meal. It's just going to take a few more hundred years to go from this being eaten 
to this being a symbol on the plate and the plate no longer being a functional plate in terms of a meal, but a symbolic one. And here, as I said, is where the turn takes when it comes to the creation of the egg. And now let's also then go um, to the bone. And the custom in France and Provence is to roast the shank bone of a sheep in memory of, and the Lord took us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Okay. Oh, gosh, sorry. Where did the... Oh, sorry. I lost the... <clears throat> the the sort the uh, I'm sorry when I'll correct this um I'll correct this slide to actually put the source on the source is also another 12th century text coming out of France um in this in this case it was talking about um uh, the, 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 yes, the, these communities in France and Provence um that they had this custom I believe it's also uh, noted that they were like like the sheep shearing community or something like that, that all of these farmers had these herds and that that is suspected as to why it is that the custom developed in this way. But this is where the shank bone began to be used. It was roasted um, and it was eaten as part of the meal. And they did something very clever. This is coming from, like I said, the 12th century. They connected back. They justified the practice with a quote from scripture. And God took us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. This is Deuteronomy. And the word here, arm, is Zroa. Right? And this is where we get the Zroa on the Seder plate. Um, now, as I said, not, not too hard to see how once this change gets into place, once we have now food on our Seder plate that is not only to be eaten, but symbolizing these various things, how it is we would then move from something that we would consume to ultimately something that we would just have on our plates, right? And it would take a couple of hundred years, but eventually we, we could see this is where our Seder plate would come from. So we have this understanding of a Seder plate as evolving from a functional plate to cook dishes, which at least traditionally one happened to be beets. Um, oh, by the way, I should also point out rice. I don't know why I didn't make this note, rice on the Seder plate. Yo, Ashkenazic Jews, rice on the Seder plate. I'm saying that again. Eat rice on Passover. It's okay. <laughs> oh, I got even a little flashy thing. Oh, nice. All right. So we see how it's gone from two cooked dishes that were eaten as part of a meal to growing symbolism that gets attached to them to then the symbolism taking over, and now it's no longer a plate, per se, right? But it is a functional ritual item within the meal. So what does this leave for us? Well, actually, before I go on, um, any, other, any other questions about any of the sources that we've looked at so far? Okay, um, I'm hoping, by the way, that slowly you're starting to feel more and more empowered to play with your Seder plate. Um, and if not, if, if not play with it, potentially consider having two. Have a traditional one and have a playful one. Just, just starting to put the thought out there because that's ultimately where I want to try to take people. And in order to kind of encourage people to truly open up one's mind and feel comfortable with playing with the Seder plate, if this evolution, this understanding that we are just part of a continuum unfolding of the meaning of these different symbols, isn't enough to kind of give you the chizuk, the strength to be like, ah, it's got to be this way. I'm not sure. I'm not comfortable with it. Let's look at this next source. Yeah. Now, this source, this source goes back to, as it says, uh, you know, the, the author here, Shreira ben Hanina, lived... Um, about 100 years, roughly speaking, from 906 to, to, to 1006. And he was the head of the Pumpadita Academy. The Pumpadita Academy, by the way, was the academy in Babylon, and it was of the most significant center of Jewish learning in the world at the time. It was the most authoritative place. If Jews had questions, it didn't matter where they were. If Jews had questions and they wanted to know how to do something, they would send the questions this way. All right, just to give you a sense of the, the, the power and authority here. And, and this was the question that was asked of, of the Gaon, right, of, of the leader 
concerning two cooked dishes. And he responded that they were in memory of two messengers, Moses and Aaron, whom God sent in Egypt, Moses and Aaron. Okay, so just want to point that out right now. Automatically, these dishes in memory of the festival, in memory of the Pesach offering? No, he gives a totally different interpretation. Right? Which is to say, just because some rabbi in Babylon 800 years before him said it had to be this way, he comes along and says, no, it doesn't. I think of it this way. Right? And, 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 and then he goes on. And there are those who add another cooked dish in memory of Miriam, as it is written. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, quoting from Micah chapter 6. So I just, I just want people to kind of take this in for a sec. Here we have a source that is doing two things. One is the source decided, and, and by the way, Rav Shrira Gaon knew Rav Yosef, right? He knew that text. He knew what the, pre the preceding generations for, ooh, you know, close to 600 years had said was the meaning of these two cook dishes. And he comes along and says, yeah, I don't agree with that. It's these two messengers. And in fact, right, so he's, he's just totally taking the, and reinterpreting it as he understands it. Now, by the way, you're very smart. He can quote the Bible. And I'm going to say, if you're going to reinterpret something, quoting a biblical text is always a good thing to have in your corner. However, he then goes on and he notes that there was a third cooked dish in honor of Miriam because it said that God sent Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Oh, my goodness. We think putting an orange on the Seder plate or the cup of Miriam is a radical thing to add. We went crazy. People would say, oh my gosh, how can you do that? And look what they're doing a thousand years before us. A thousand years before us, they're bringing in Miriam and they're adding things. What chutzpah? I like it. And I would encourage all of us to understand this text is the invitation to be chutzpah dick with our Seder plates. If a thousand years ago they could add new meanings on top of a tradition that they knew and add another dish, really? Do we think substituting the shank bone out because it's something we don't care for because we think we can put in something better? We think that's radical? My friends, we've got some catching up to do. This is just the start of being a little radical, but they're way ahead of us already. Right. And so I want to encourage people to kind of look at the Seder plate and be like, you know what? Because of where I'm coming from, shank bone doesn't speak to me. What other options might I have? And I challenge people. Right. If something doesn't speak to you. Right. Being grumpy about it is one way to go. Fetching about it is a traditional kind of response. But how about actually just changing it to something that's meaningful to us? Right, this, this text, these texts, this learning that we've shared with you, I'm hoping makes it perfectly clear that this is a perfectly traditional Jewish thing to do. Because traditionally, as you can see, we've been doing and messing with this plate for thousands of years, right? So when it comes to something like the shank bone, I encourage people to think, you know, if, if you want to go traditional and you, and you like the idea of beats, which is one way that people came at it, terrific. But there are other ways to do it. And I consider, and I would ask people to consider them the following. What is the meaning of it? The meaning of it is to reflect strength. The meaning of it is to try to capture that idea that we were helped, that there was strength that was given to us that helped bring us out. Okay, the shank bone, I understand where that comes from. Not my group. But what might be? And I would just use that as the framework and then let your imagination go to where it goes. <laughs> I once did this, by the way, I was, a, I was a pulpit rabbi for many years and I once just asked this question of the nursery school kids and the kindergarten kids because I was often in the, in, in the schools with them. I sort of said, like, what represents strength to you? Like, if you were going to put strength on your Seder plate, what would it be? <laughs> and this one, this one kid said, the arm of my favorite doll. Right. 
you know, because he's thinking like the arm of, like he's thinking kind of literally the arm of, but but that's what represented strength, right? I think it might have been a GI Joe doll, but I didn't really kind of go into too much details there. Um, but but okay, fine. That's that's what it represents. So in the article that you will get, you'll get the link for from from us. You'll see my Jewish learning lists out a number of different possibilities. However. That's just one source. I encourage people to, to, to get onto the internet, to pop in there, alternatives for shank bone and so forth. And you'll see there's a number of different ways to do it. And I would encourage people the following. Just because someone else said this is the way they're doing it on the internet doesn't make them any better or any worse than Rav Yosef 2000 years ago. And it doesn't make them any more right. All right? Again, I encourage our finding it for ourselves for the ways that make sense for us, which is why in order to avoid controversy, I've often suggested, right, that people get, as I alluded to before, two Seder plates, right? Why does it have to be one Seder plate, right? Why can't it be a traditional Seder plate and then one Seder plate where you just go to town, come up with different ways of interpreting and understanding these different symbols and what they might mean in a way that makes sense for us for our families, for our individuals. There's so much going on in the world right now. There's so many elements of our world that we can draw attention to and bring into our stories by how we put and what we put on that Seder plate. It's an opportunity for us to bring that ritual alive in a way that's not only just for those of us who are plant-based who are looking at the egg and looking at the shank bone and are like, yo, not my thing, right? Seder plate can be so, so much more than just beyond tackling those particular symbols. We have an opportunity, I think, to engage in it in a way that makes it meaningful for us. With that having been said, I'm just going to invite any questions, any um, uh, ideas, thoughts, criticisms, anything. Open it up. Have a go. Marilyn had a few questions. Marilyn, if you want to go um, off mute and ask your questions. Um, what is, uh, what's Leviathan have to do with fish? What's the, I mean, yeah. Okay. So, so here, here's a, here's a curious element of Jewish tradition, which is Jewish tradition understood that there were ancient Near Eastern mythologies out there other than just the one that we tell about the Garden of Eden. And in those ancient myth mythologies, there are these massive sea creatures, right? And there's actually some rabbinic midrashim, some rabbinic teachings about them, because they are referred to in various places in, 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 in our sacred literature. And, and it, it's the Leviathan is the name of the creature. And it is seen as this, this, this massive sea creature um, of, 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 of mythic, mythic proportions and tales. And so that's, that's the correspondence, the fish to correspond with the Leviathan. That, that's where the, the connection comes from. Okay. And, and I don't know what um, a shore habor is. And me, <laughs> me to correspond with shore habor. Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, that's why um, it, when he was noting this, uh, Rabbi Kulp put this C Rashi on Psalm uh, 50, um, uh, chapter 50, verse 10, which is to say, nobody knows exactly what Shor Habor is, right? So you need the commentary, like that, that's, that, that word was written, oh, you know, give or take about 3,000 years ago. And the person who lived 1,000 years ago didn't even know what it meant and is the person we're relying on for the comment. And it just reflects that there's certain words that we have in our Bible that we simply speculate as to what they can be. And this is one, and Rashi's speculation, because of various other allusions, is that this is referring to me. I, it's not a great answer, by the way. I'm just telling you what it is, though. <laughs> I have a question. I'm Aaron. You're, you're muted again. What is Ziz Sedai? Uh, uh, Ziz Sedai um, <clears throat> refers to a bird. And that's why it corresponds to egg. Hmm. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So David has a question too. Hi, Rabbi. Um, 
my husband was raised uh, in an Orthodox uh, community in England. He has a real hard time accepting that it is okay for Ashkenazi Jews to eat rice on Pesach. <laughs> and it, it just seems like it's such an ingrained uh, ritual for him that he just can't understand why all of a sudden we can eat rice. Understood. Uh, understood. And, 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 and Lisa, I say this because, 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 because I do know your husband and I, I'm sorry to say there's just no hope. Nothing I'm going to say, <laughs> nothing I'm going to say is going to convince him <laughs> at <laughs> all. Okay? So just, 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 yeah, I can, 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 be, because and I'll tell you why. And this is a very important part of this whole conversation to realize, <laughs> right? Is that these things don't speak just to our minds. These things speak to our hearts, right? The customs and rituals that we grew up with that are part of us, this is part of who we are and how we understand ourselves. This is not only how we live in our present, this is how we connect with our past, right? And so... To kind of come along with some with with one that's so sort of deeply ingrained in terms of food, a which is just so deeply ingrained in general, and b some of these elements around Passover, right? Because just just think of it this way: as one of my teachers once said to me, generally, and and his words not mine, he says generally when you look at kashrut, you know you can kind of look and say, ah, the Jewish people when it comes to food are a little insane. And then he said, and when it comes to Passover, you get to say, ah, the Jewish people, when it comes to food, are totally insane, <laughs> right? Because Passover is a level of kashrut that is totally insane, right? It demands of us, just this, just if you're practically following all the, the, the details of it, it demands of us so much more in terms of kashrut than any other time of the year. So it goes to show how important it, 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 it holds for us. So rice is one of those things, which, yes, it has been a part of Sephardic communities for a long time. It's been a part of Jewish tradition that you can have rice on Passover, as we see, for 2,000 years. But over time, certain concerns became associated with rice and other legumes, right? And in a, in a, in a, in a festival that's already limiting of food, all it takes is for one community to be like, yeah, we don't do that. And all of a sudden, it'll spread. As we see, we're eating eggs, or we have eggs on the Seder plate, not eating, and we have eggs on our Seder plate because there was a community that began interpreting it one way, right? And these things really take hold. So for certain Ashkenazic Jews, it's just impossible to convince them. It's not a logic argument. It's just impossible to convince that 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 rice is going to be okay. And God bless love your husband. I don't think I could ever convince him. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but it's it, it one of the in, interesting things I just want to share is whereas in Sephardic communities it's always been permissible to eat rice because they've been mixing with us Ashkenazic Jews we've contaminated their thinking in this regard and now you find more and more Sephardic Jews who are not eating rice, or it has to be only if it comes from a hexer place where you had this supervision, da da da, in ways that it it didn't used to be before. <sighs> not something I'm proud of. A lot, a lot that I love about Ashkenazic Jewry. The spreading of this particular one is it's not my favorite. Jonathan, before you uh, you close, and I know we're heading into our next uh, speaker, there is some um, desire to hear about. Um, how we are supposed to take care of animals in our tradition. Um, so I don't know if you just want to close on anything around that. Absolutely. So here, here's here's one of the things that I've been thinking about and, and that we've been talking about um, as a team in terms of how we look at animals, how we tie it even to this to this holiday. You know, one of the things about uh, about Passover. Um, is is of sharing uh, with 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 Kayla as we were, we've been discussing an article is that Passover is not meant to be just a liberation from physical oppression. It's also meant to be a liberation from mental oppression, which is to say the systems of thought that blind us to what's going on in front of us. 
And when we think about this time and we think about our tradition's obligation to take care of animals, one of the things I would encourage people to both consider for ourselves as well as to be able to bring into conversation is how we are, in a sense, unable and struggle to see what's going on right in front of us in terms of how animals are treated within the society and the general level of indecency that we show not only, that we show basically to all animals, right? And our tradition demands of us and requires of us that we are stewards of these of the entire earth as well as the other animals with whom we share it. And this is a time where we need to, in a sense, free ourselves and help others be free from a system of thought that has us not be able to see what's happening right in front of us. Because this element of being, of tending to and being stewards of the earth is to my mind, the fundamental quality of how we relate to and how we manifest what it is to be created in the image of the divine. And we need to be able to free ourselves from certain patterns of thought so we can see the path that we need to walk. Um, we're going to take a little five minute break. We're going to just kind of give everyone an opportunity to stretch for a second. We're going to begin at 11 o'clock. I want to thank all of you for joining us, for, for coming here. Please feel free if you want to unmute yourselves for a second and just chat or cross chat um, before we have our next presenter, uh, Professor Adrian Crowe. Thank you. Thank you all so very much and yeah. look forward to our continued learning. Thank you. Lisa, was there anything else I needed to say? You did it. Great job. Okay. Yes, yeah, screen sharing. God, that's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa? Yes. Have you seen the Netflix movie, You Are What You Eat? I have seen probably 50% of it. My family was watching it, but I was yeah. coming in and out a little bit. You didn't like it? I did like it. I was, um, I'm a graduate student and I was working on an assignment. So I was, I needed to come in and out a little I bit. Think you will love, really it. I think you will love the ending. I did not see the ending. I, I need to get back into it. You a lot of my see... neighbors watched it and have said it's totally impacted their, their food choices yep. now. Yep. Yep. I think you will like the ending. Okay. Uh, thanks for the reminder. I need to get back onto those last few episodes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Is it okay if I test my slides? Please. That's that's why we wanted to give this just just have this little break. If there's anything that you need to do, go go right ahead. Are you seeing this? Yes, we are. Yes. Okay. Okay. I can stop sharing until it's time. I just wanted to okay. make sure. So. Okay. Um, is it 11 o'clock yet? Can we get started? Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. So let's get started. Pacific. I'm sorry. It's eleven o'clock Pacific. Yeah. Sorry. I I am I am terribly biased time wise. I, I I'm working on it. Definitely working on it. Um. All right. So my friends, um, we're going to continue our our, our Zader Hader learning, and we're really so pleased and honored to have Dr. Adrian Crone join us 
for our learning. Dr. Dr. Krohn is a, is a good friend of ours, um, a Jewish Initiative for Animals, and also has done work with all the different organizations here in this space and serves on our advisory board um, and is also the director of Jewish life at Allegheny College and assistant professor of religious studies. Um, her research focuses on Jewish communal farms and sustainable Jewish farming movement in the United States, which is where I first came across her work and first learned a tremendous amount about the Jewish farming movement and what's out there. Um, her expertise ranges from the history of religion in the US to modern Judaism to religion and food. Uh, she holds a PhD in American religion from Duke University and her extensive experience in Jewish communal service includes working with youth and youth groups, teaching and directing a religious school program for Jewish teens, liturgical leadership and staffing a birthright trip. It is a pleasure to be able to share this faith with her and, and to have this opportunity to be able to learn with Dr. Adrian Crown. Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so to set this up, um, I am talking about food labor today. Um, I'm going to focus on the animal agriculture industry, but the issues <laughs> pervade all of agriculture and a number of other industries too. Um, but a lot of this is um, connected to the Passover story. Um, a lot of the, and, and we'll get to some texts, but a lot of the invocations for caring for our neighbors, for the strangers in our land, for laborers are related to um, the biblical experience um, in in Egypt um, and often include um, the line for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So we're going to, we're, as we kind of prepare for Passover, um, thinking about the people who are um, deeply embedded in vulnerable ways in the food system um, is a helpful way to kind of bring that uh, that commemoration for for we were strangers in the land of Egypt um, into being a little bit more conscious around what we eat. Um, so this is um, I'm, I pulled things from here. I teach a course um, at Allegheny called Judaism, Justice and Food. We actually had food labor week last week. So we, um, I just did this with my classes and I'm bringing you um, a little taste um, of some of the, the things that we wrestle with in that class. So we're gonna look at um, some initial um, overview material about migrant uh, labor um, and um, where migrant workers are working um, in animal agriculture. Then we're going to look at some of these Jewish sources um, that that might guide our thinking around um, how how we as Jews should be thinking about both migrant migrants generally, immigrants generally, um, but then also specifically migrant workers. Um, and then we're going to look at two case studies. Um, the first case study uh, folks, especially on this call, might be familiar with um, thinking about some of the things that happened at a kosher slaughterhouse um, called agroprocessors a number of years ago. Um, and then the second case study um, is from a book called Every 12 Seconds. Um, and so where the first case study focuses a little bit more on, um, there's generally two sides uh, to a slaughterhouse and we'll talk about this when we get there, um, but we're gonna do a little a little hot side um, where, where the animals are actually slaughtered and then a little cold side um, and thinking about the workers who are processing um, uh, meat essentially. We're gonna get to some solutions and then hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. So away we go. And if people have things in the chat, I'll try to keep an eye on it, but I, um, well, if, if- We're gonna monitor the chat for you, Adrian. So we'll we'll monitor some great. solutions and, and leave some time at the end. Great, great. Um, that would help a lot. Okay. So migrant labor overview. Um, some things to keep in mind. So um, generally I have this split into thinking about factory farm labor. So people that are working um, in large scale animal uh, op animal operations. Um, and so um, I have slaughterhouse labor um, separate. So when we think about factory farm labor, so people working raising animals, 
Um, that's about 700,000 full and part-time workers um, annually in the United States. And a large percentage of those workers are people of color, um, primarily uh, migrant workers from Mexico and other parts of Latin America, but also migrant workers from other parts of the world. Um, and so there are increasing populations of migrant labor um, from Asia and from Africa. And so generally, um, the, this is being done by migrant workers and still to, still um, primarily from Mexico and Latin America. Um, several thousand, which you will note is a small percentage of 700,000, um, are brought in each year through the H-2A work visa program um, as temporary agricultural workers. So those are the that small percentage are the workers that are coming in with um, legal documentation. And then because this is hard to track because people are for very good reason and not usually willing to tell people about their immigration status if they are undocumented, um, a very large but unknown percentage of the workers are undocumented. And so as we think about who these workers are, we should be thinking about them as people in a in a vulnerable situation because of their immigration status. So often they are, so we'll talk about this, there's exemptions um, that mean that a lot of these places are not following like OSHA standards for health and safety. Um, but then also um, the workers are less uh, willing often to report unsafe conditions um, or or harassment or other issues because they are also undocumented and reporting things could mean they get uh, sent home. So um, there are many different types of factory farms. Um, and so the, the image here is a dairy farm. Um, so we, we might think about dairy farms, we might think about um, cattle operations that are raising uh, cattle for meat. Um, chicken industry, um, generally there's breeding of chickens. And so those are egg operations and then poultry operations focused on meat, um, less related um, to Jewish communities, but um, the US also produces a huge amount of pork. And so um, a lot of uh, factory farm labor is in the pork industry as well. And then smaller amounts um, in, in other um, animal industries. And so because uh, this work um, crosses a number of different animal groups, um, these, these operations are set up differently, but this work often includes um, pretty um, unpleasant tasks, um, things like administering antibiotics to animals that don't want to be administered antibiotics, castrating animals, um, cutting off beaks, or in some cases, tails, um, treating or killing sick animals injured or weak animals and transportation of animals. Um, because they're working, a lot of these facilities, um, you can see um, this is a milking room at a dairy farm. Um, so often where the cows um, are housed um, has some open air at least. Um, they're often like cement facilities that have open um, sides. Um, but then they do come in indoors for milking. Um, a lot of the, the poultry facilities are just indoors. And so factory farm workers um, are exposed to often hazardous levels of particulates, ammonia, um, ammonia is particular to poultry, um, and or hydrogen sulfide. Um, I mentioned this a little bit, but agricultural employees generally in the U.S. Um, and this varies state to state, but it's pretty consistent um, in terms of exemptions. Um, they are exempt, um, agric agricultural uh, operations are exempt from paying their workers minimum wage and or overtime. And so workers are often paid um, far less um, than, than people in other industries. And so then moving to slaughterhouses, so kind of on the other side of the industry, um, slaughterhouses and meat processing facilities employ about 500,000 workers. So to total here, we have about 1.2 million workers working in animal agriculture. Um, again, a large percentage of these workers are um, people of color and or people um, living in low income communities. Um, 
slaughterhouse labor in particular has a really high turnover rate that often exceeds 100% annually, which means most workers don't make it a full year um, at their place of employment. Again, an unknown percentage of these workers are undocumented. Um, and so most of these workers then are at will employees, which means they can be fired basically at any time at the supervisor's discretion. And so they're, they're vulner vulnerable on multiple levels. Um, their jobs are vulnerable, their immigration status is vulnerable, um, and, and on and on and on. Um, when we think about slaughterhouse labor, um, we're thinking about a large assembly line. And so I already mentioned this, the kind of industry logo uh, lingo here is the hot side um, is where the animals um, come in alive, are slaughtered, um, and are processed um, off animals uh, have a high body temperature like we do. Um, and so when people call this the hot side of the plant, they actually mean it's very hot um, because the animals are hot, the people are hot. Um, and so this is the kind of initial breakdown um, of the animals. Um, this is where a lot of people often um, have been um, transformed into vegetarians and vegans. So um, some of you all might be familiar with the kinds of things that happen on the hot side of a slaughterhouse. Um, but these duties um, include um, things like killing, bleeding, um, and doing some of the initial cuts to the animals. And then as they start to break down um, the animal's body into different parts, you'll see um, rooms like in the image here, which are on the cold side of a slaughterhouse. And so on the cold side, they're what they're doing is transforming an animal into the cuts that can be sold at stores um, so that you can can market and say, this is just the ribs. <laughs> um, and so somebody has to do that work to cut the ribs away from the rest of the animals and, and on and on and on. Um, we'll talk um, later about um, a liver a liver room, which um, is a tricky kosher meat, but <laughs> um, an interesting um, example from a book about what happens on the cold side. So slaughterhouses generally are a little bit more regulated um, than the factory farms. Um, there are laws in place that guarantee workers a safe and healthy environment um, because this is where um, food is actually being processed. So the USDA has supervisors in the plants. Um, OSHA, the Self and uh, Safety and Health Administration also, um, Occupational Safety and Health Administration also has uh, supervisors in the plants. Um, that supervision is complicated. Um, the animal industry advocates and lobbies for itself. <laughs> and so um, these, these are complicated issues, but there is more supervision in slaughterhouses than there is on factory farms. Um, but the work generally still requires long hours. And often um, one of the primary issues here is that they're, the workers are doing uh, assembly line work. And so they often have repetitive stress injuries, depending on what they're doing on the assembly line um, to their hands, wrists, arms, shoulders, and back, because they're standing in the same position doing, you know, if they're cutting something, if they're moving something, they're doing the same um, repetitive motion all day, um, which um, as, as people with human bodies, um, you hopefully all understand um, are things that are difficult for our human bodies. I know as I get older, um, I can do something just one time and then the next day I am in a great deal of pain. And so a lot of the turnover in um, slaughterhouses is related to just not being able to do the work anymore because um, part of somebody's body is has, has resisted um, their long-term ability to do so. So moving, um, kind of taking a break <laughs> and moving to some of the Jewish sources, um, to start to think about, so, okay, so this is our industry. Um, how can we as Jews uh, start to frame our thinking or hopefully not start, but continue to frame our thinking about these issues? Um, so our first text here um, comes from Deuteronomy um, and uh, chapter 24. And so um, this, uh, hopefully um, people know some pieces of, of these texts, but um, I'll read it just so we can all be on the same page um, in English. So you shall not abuse a needy and destitute laborer, 
whether a fellow countryman or a stranger in one of the communities in your land. You must pay him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is needy and urgently depends on it. Else he will cry out to the Lord against you and you will incur guilt. So reading this, I, I imagine many of you are maybe an initial thought is in the United States, it is extremely rare that any of us get paid on the same day. Um, that's generally not how payment works anywhere. Um, my institution is working on getting us paid twice a month instead of once a month um, because it is better for workers um, to be paid more often um, because things come up in life. And so here, um, the the uh, the command the command for Jews is that um, doing any less than paying workers who who are living we might talk about today like paycheck to paycheck, doing any less than paying them at the end of the day they just did the work pay them before they go home. Um, uh, incurs the, <laughs> the wrath of the Lord. And so um, it is probably unreasonable to imagine we could, we could change the entire pay structure um, in the United States, but it is something to think about that we as Jews, um, whenever possible, should be thinking about getting people the money for the work that they have done as soon as possible and without overcomplicated delays, um, which um, often happen um, in, in, in many industries. Going to our next text, um, so thinking about the fact that a lot of these workers are migrant workers in particular, so this is from Leviticus, and this really kind of uh, makes the connection to Passover. So when a stranger resides with you in your land, you shall not wrong him. The stranger who resides with you shall be to you as one of your citizens. You shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I, the Lord, am your God. Um, and so when we think about, um, when I talked about this in my class last week, a lot of the students reflected that, you know, what's going on here is like a multi-tiered dehumanization process. So we've already dehumanized animals and said animals are different, a different kind of animal than human animals. And so we, and I'm not saying the people on this call, right, but um, uh, we'll say the, the animal agriculture industry for sure um, has said um, animals do not deserve the same kind of treatment that humans would deserve. Um, but then there's also another layer here where it's it's that migrant workers who are undocumented, who are vulnerable, um, who are dealing with systemic racism and overt racism um, also are not like other humans that deserve breaks and <laughs> the ability to uh, work at a meaningful job and get paid what their work is worth. Um, and so in a lot of ways, um, this commandment in particular um, should strike us as as something that we um, have some work to do if we want to live up to it. If we really want to say the strangers in our land are loved the way we love ourselves um, and that we're treating them the way that we treat citizens, because um, in animal agriculture and in many other industries, that's just not the case. And then um, from the Mishnah now, I just have to move. Okay, had the little pictures covering some of the text. Um, so from the Mishnah, um, kind of expanding on some of these um, these commandments from the Hebrew Bible, from the Torah, um, we have from Baba Metzia, one who hires workers and instructs them to begin work early and to stay late in a place in which it is not the custom to begin work early and to stay late, the employer must not force them to do so. In a place in which it is custom to feed the workers, he must do so. In a place in which the custom is to distribute sweets, he must do so. Everything goes according to the custom of the land. Um, and so I think this one is, is particularly inter interesting when we think about some of the exemptions that, that the United States has um, formalized in, in policy, in the law, um, where agriculture is exempt from the kinds of 
practices that we say should be the practice for all workers. Um, so I don't think that we have any customs um, where workers get sweets, but that would be lovely. Uh, but we do, um, in many other cases, um, require people to to have a certain number of breaks so that they can eat, so that they can take care, care of other biological needs. Um, and um, in many cases, we are also um, legally restricting the hours that people work and saying that if they work more than those hours, if they say work early and stay late, um, they're paid overtime um, over and above their pay for that work. And because agriculture has exemptions for a lot of these things, um, what we see is an industry that is not um, following the, the laws of the land, as it were. Um, and so then there's a story here. Um, so a story is told about Rabbi Yochanan ben Matia, who told his son, go hire us workers. His son went and promised them food without specifying what kind or how much. When he returned, his father said to him, my son, even if you gave them a feast like that of King Solomon, you would not have, a you would not have fulfilled your obligation toward them, for they are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. However, as they have not yet begun to work, go back and say to them that their employment is conditional on their not demanding more than bread and vegetables. Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel said, it is not necessary to make such a stipulation. Everything goes according to the custom of the place. And so really here, this is reinforcing this idea that you're meant to govern your workers according to the laws of the place that you live in. Now we might say the laws of the place that we live in have agricultural exemptions, or we might say the laws of the place we live in are this, and we should think about the fact that there are any exemptions because otherwise we have said workers deserve a certain um, a certain level of of rights. And so thinking about um, what happens, right? What, how does this look um, in, in the real world um, and, and where have we seen issues? Um, the first case study is gonna be agri-processors. Um, so there's a little bit of overview information on this slide. Um, this was a kosher slaughterhouse um, in Iowa. Um, at its height, um, it produced 60% of the kosher beef in the country and 40% of the kosher uh, chicken, kosher poultry. And there have been a number of, uh, <laughs> of popular media stories about agro-processors. Aaron Gross, um, who founded uh, the Jewish Initiative for Animals, wrote a book that interrogates um, agro-processors in depth. Um, but Broadly, um, the plant had many issues, <laughs> um, and so they had um, abuses related to how they were treating animals, they had abuses related to how they were treating the environment, and what in the end becomes the issue for them is, is the labor issue. So we're going to look at all three of these. Um, and so um, I, as we look through these, I think what is what is something for all of us to think about and ponder is this plant is rife with problems. This plant is also not unique. Um, there's there, except for the fact that the, the actual um, slaughter of the animals was happening in a kosher manner. Um, it looked like lots of other slaughterhouses and the abuses were similar. Um, and in the end, it wasn't the animal abuses that shut down agri-processors. It wasn't the environmental abuses. It was the labor issues. And so um, as we as we think about um, the multiple levels of abuse that are happening in this industry, that's a helpful thing to keep in mind is we see that like dehumanization hierarchy at work a little bit. Um, when something happens to animals, it's a problem, but it doesn't shut down the plant. When something happens to humans, um, it ended up in the end, in this case, shutting down the plant. So the animal issues, um, there was a PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals investigation. Um, this was in an era before some of the um, agricultural gag laws that now prohibit undercover investigations in places like slaughterhouses. Um, but that investigation revealed um, and and you might want to turn me off for a second if you just ate lunch or something or breakfast, depending on your time zone. Um, but it revealed that workers um, were doing a procedure. Um, so after um, the ritual slaughter, 
the workers were ripping the tracheas and esophagi out of the the cattle um, to to inspect them because there has to be a clear cut um, for it to be kosher. Um, but this procedure, the the removal of the trache trachea and esophagus, is not required by kosher laws. Um, it was just something that was easier for the workers um, to check the cut and move the line a little bit quicker. Um, and what it did do is this is often a time during kosher, kosher slaughter where the animal um, in many cases was still conscious. Um, and so they were causing additional unnecessary harm to the animals. Um, Dr. Temple Grandin, who is a, a animal scientist said it was the worst thing she had seen in over 30 kosher slaughterhouses. So when we talk about agroprocessors, we're talking about a particularly bad <laughs> um, kosher slaughterhouse that was producing, again, 60% of the kosher beef in the country and 40% of the poultry. In terms of environmental issues, um, in 2006, agroprocessors paid a fine. This is very common. There are exemptions um, for, ag for agricultural operations to pay fines for environmental pollution instead of dealing with the environmental pollution. Um, and so in this case, they paid a $600,000 fine um, for violating local wastewater regulations um, because they were just depositing untreated water from the plant directly into local rivers. Um, so this was kind of runoff from cleaning their floors or cleaning their equipment that had um, animal residue and, and all sorts of things. And it was just going into local water. Um, and so not ideal. But as I mentioned, right, so what happens in the end is that it's the labor issues um, that that end up closing down the plant. So um, on May 12th, 2008, U.S. Uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, um, raided the plant and arrested 389 um, immigrant workers um, and 305 were arrested on criminal charges. This is related to their... Um, their status as undocumented workers. Um, 297 were sentenced on federal felony charges um, for fraud because they had been using stolen social security numbers in addition to being undocumented. So um, for people that were, un were just undocumented, there was the criminal charges. And then for people that had also um, been charged with using stolen social security numbers because they didn't have them, um, there was an additional level of charges. Um, when we think again about how uh, dehumanization is working here, um, the workers were held um, as they were being processed for these charges. They were held in fairgrounds um, in Iowa nearby um, that were usually used for cattle. Um, and so they literally put them into um, uh, facilities that were usually used to store uh, cattle um, while they were being processed. Um, once the immigration issues started to be processed, as, as these undocumented workers start to talk to immigration officials, um, the plant was additionally investigated for violating child labor laws, although there are also exemptions to many child labor laws um, for animal agriculture, as well as sexual abuse and solicitation. And so other things start to come out about how workers were being treated within the plant when they start to actually talk to officials, since they're already going to be um, charged with something and sent home, they might as well let people know what's actually going on. Um, so a number of people were charged. Um, the primary person was Shlo uh, Sholem Raboshkin. Um, in 2009, he was convicted on 86 charges of financial fraud, mail and wire fraud, and money laundering related to what was going on at this plant. Um, and more recently, on December 20th, 2017, um, when President Trump was in office, he commuted his sentence um, so Rabashkin ended up serving eight years of a 27 year uh, sentence. And so even when we see some consequences um, for these kinds of things, um, you know, administrations change and people are um, are released. Um, so our second case study, just to give you a sense of the other side. So this will take us to the cold room. Um, the Cold Side. So uh, this is a book by Timothy Pacharat, who's a political scientist, um, and he did a full year 
working undercover um, in a meat processing plant, um, he says, in the Midwest, because he has to anonymize it. Um, it's not a kosher plant. Um, and um, he kind of moves through different positions in the plant. But the, the excerpt that we're going to look at, the excerpts that we're going to look at are from his first position. Um, so he's a brand new worker. Um, and um, as such, he gets put in a um, less desirable job. And so his first job is in the liver room. Um, and his job there is to um, as livers come down the line, so they've, someone else has separated them out from the rest of the cow's body. The liver is on a hook coming down the line. His job is to take it from this hook, put it on that hook, and then wipe the hook before it goes back around again. And so it's just liver, hook, wipe, liver, hook, wipe. And then every five wipes, he has to dip the rag and, and in water again. Um, and so he talks a lot about, um, so A, this is the cold side of the plant. So now they're processing meat. So he's wearing multiple layers. Um, and on the days when the water from the rag would get into his his clothing, um, he's wearing gloves, he's wearing a coat, but some of the days it would get into his clothing and then he's just freezing for the rest of the day because it's like 40 something degrees in the liver room. Um, and so we often think about the hot side and, and what workers are dealing with there, um, but we don't often think about like what workers are, are dealing with on the cold side of the plant. So um, Hatcherat can help us think through that. So um, this is an initial quote um, about some of the labor in the liver room. So he says, as days on the liver line stretch into weeks and months, my body settles into a repertoire of tasks of tactile sensations. In addition to the feel of hot livers and cold wet rags, there's the strangeness, which becomes familiarity of having my face and neck be the only exposed parts of my body. One day after something half liquid and half flesh spurts from a liver into my left eye, I request a pair of clear plastic safety goggles from Oscar. And so things to think about here, my class talked about this at length um, by the, of their own volition <laughs> um, because it's, it's, it's this kind of like mundane horror, right? So he's, he's moving his livers from, from side to side. The livers are hot. He's cold. And safety goggles were not part of his uniform, right? So he's on his first day, he's given boots, he's given a coat, he's given a helmet. Um, and it's not until liver liquid spurts into his eye that he has to go request safety goggles. Um, and so when we think about like, yes, OSHA is in this plant in theory, um, protecting workers, right? Workers are not guaranteed the kind of safety equipment that they might actually need. Um, and, off, and he's able to advocate for himself and go get it, but not everybody can, right? Um, he's a, a um, documented actually, um, quite educated um, worker in this plant, which is not the situation of many of his coworkers. Um, and so a lot of what he talks about in the chapter is that on the cold side of the plant, um, what people are doing is like, they're participating in this really violent industry, but they're doing it at a distance, right? And so um, he, he reflects a lot on that. So this is, um, it's, uh, actually the last, it's the longest sentence on the planet, um, but it's the last sentence um, of, of this chapter. Uh, the chapter is called 100,000 Livers. Um, and so I'll try to make it through this. I'll probably have to stop and, and breathe sometimes. But he says, this too becomes killing at a distance, laboring day after day, hanging freshly gutted body parts from animals one never saw or heard or smelled or touched in life. The feel of freezing air through multiple layers of clothing, the smell of perforated livers rising to the nostrils in traceable ste steam, the humming, clanging, clinking, deafening mechanical soundscape, and the sight of liver after liver descending against a dull white wall, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, until it constitutes an endless, infinite landscape in which the slaughtered cow has no place and against which every act of disruption, no matter how minuscule, becomes an expression of being, of knowing that you are still there. 
And so he talks about like in his work on the liver line, there's a lot of, so it's, it's almost exclusively men um, working um, in this part of the plant, in most parts of the plant. Um, and, and so they, they end up getting into fights with like the men at the next step about whose job it is to clean the cart. So it's definitely their job to clean the hooks, but the cart that gets moved with the livers on it, um, there's a little bit of like contestation over who's supposed to clean it. And so they get in these like silly fights about who cleans the liver cart because it reminds them that they're humans, right? Because doing this work is so dehumanizing in itself because the livers are just coming down that line and your job is just grab a liver, move it over there, wipe the hook. And, and trying to keep up, the book is called Every 12 Seconds, um, because that is the speed at which cattle are killed in this factory. And so every 12 seconds, there's a new liver uh, coming down the line. And and even as as, as somebody who, who is being really thoughtful about this kind of work, who's um, intentionally paying attention, you know, being intentional about what this kind of work means, he is subject to that kind of dehumanization, to becoming just like a cog in the machine um, from from doing this kind of work. So what are we gonna do about this? Cause that was a bummer, right? Um, so um, just first, um, I, I'm uh, giving you a sense. So I already talked about every 12 seconds um, and I talked a little bit about Aaron Gross's book. Um, but there are many, many other resources. So these are the ones I assign in my class. Um, so Aaron Gross's book is The Question of the Animal and Religion, Theoretical Stakes, Practical Implications. Um, he goes in depth about agroprocessors, if that, if you want to read um, about how the OU um, determined that the meat that was coming out of agroprocessors was still kosher because the cut was kosher. Um, if you want to read about some of those negotiations, that's all there. Um, every 12 seconds, um, you'll, you kind of move with Timothy Pacharat through this plant. So he starts in the liver room. Um, he goes through a couple other positions on the cold side, and then he ends up on the hot side, um, in part because he speaks English. And so he actually gets promoted a number of times during his year working in the plant because um, he has access to a language that a lot of the workers don't have access to. Um, and so he ends up on the inspection side by the end, um, working with the inspectors, um, doing some of that work. So um, that's a really um, in-depth look at like multiple different uh, modes of labor in a slaughterhouse. And then um, less related <laughs> to um, the, uh, the mission of, of Jiffa in particular, but certainly related to thinking about agriculture. Um, I also assign um, in thinking about food labor um, chapters from Seth Holmes's book, Fresh Fruit, Broken Bodies, um, which considers um, the, the kind of movement of migrant laborers um, into, um, uh, into plant and uh, so vegetable, and, and in this case, mostly fruit agriculture. Um, so he he crosses the border with undocumented workers and talks about that experience. And then he goes up to Washington State. Um, and so it's mostly strawberries, blueberries, um, and some fruit trees, some orchards, um, and talks about some of um, the work that, that laborers are doing in the fields. And um, he's an MD, PhD, so he's also interested particularly in their access or lack of access to health care. So Thinking about, again, some of the repetitive motion, um, uh, kneeling, crouching in fields, and then not being able to access health care because um, they don't have documentation. So um, these are some good resources if you want to do deep dives. Um, there are also a number of organizations working on um, farm worker justice. Um, so there's um, a nonprofit <laughs> dedicated to farm worker justice called Farm Worker Justice. Um, that is seeking to improve the living and working conditions um, in terms of immigration uh, immigration status, health and occupational safety um, for farm workers. Um, there's also a faith-based organization, the National Farm Worker Ministry. Um, and then um, another group, um, again, more particular to um, 
in this case, tomato agriculture, um, is the coalition of Immokalee workers. Um, and, and there were particular issues. So these, uh, Immokalee is a place in Florida where they grow most of the tomatoes for the United States. Um, and in that case, um, the, because the workers were migrant laborers, because they were particularly vulnerable, um, and this is true, um, in a lot of, um, plant agriculture, um, uh, a lot of the workers are paid by weight. Um, and so the more they pick, the more they get paid. Um, and so it's not hourly. It's not based on anything but how many tomatoes they can get into um, their containers. And so um, that puts a lot of pressure um, and undue bodily stress on workers. And so the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has done a lot of advocacy um, for farm workers. You're all here today. So you're doing the next best step, which is to make the conscious choices this Passover and think about um, what you're putting on your plates, thinking about how you're talking about um, some of these ancient texts that actually do have a lot of relevance today when we think about um, the kinds of uh, backbreaking work that we often talk about um, that our ancestors in Egypt were subjected to. We might think about the kind of backbreaking work that people are subjected to today. Um, and Jiffa, of course, has many resources um, and, um, it, and Haggadah supplements and all sorts of things and, and um, amazing Zoom events um, to prepare people um, for having a, a more conscious Passover. Um, and I wanted, I, I think I did an okay job. Okay, I wanted to leave time for Q&A. So I've said a lot and now um, I want to hear from all of you. So maybe I'll even stop sharing my screen so I can see people and hopefully I can answer some questions. Adrian, thank you so much for educating us and helping us be better speakers as we try to educate our family and friends and fellow Seder goers on what it is why we eat the way we eat. Really appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna uh, ask you some of the questions and then if I don't get to them, you know, people can hop in as well. So there's a question you said um, about how workers are treated. So if if we were to go with the customs of the land, which is something you said in one of your slides, what if the customs of the land is to treat workers harshly? It seems from the text that we should only follow the custom of the land and not do more or less. Is that accurate? So that would be accurate. Um, I think that in some of the, um, this is where I think like the invocations of like the experience of ancient Israelites in slavery is instructive though, that right, the custom of Egypt was to enslave workers and make them build things or whatever they were doing. Um, and uh, we didn't particularly enjoy that. And so I think that Right. This is um, the kind of old invocation that like just because they're the laws doesn't mean they're just. Right. And so I think. Just as we did not um, enjoy. The particular uh, approach towards labor that that ancient Egypt held, I think we should be able to say we don't particularly enjoy uh, the approach to labor that the United States is currently operating under. Thank you. Um, did you say that undercover operations are no longer happening? And if so, why? And what is being done instead? Yeah, so this would be uh, state dependent, um, but many states and and in in uh, most cases, it's the, the states where animal agriculture or agriculture in general is a primary um, industry. Um, there have been laws put into place. So um, I did my graduate work at Duke in North Carolina. Um, and while I was there, um, so I was there from 2009 to 2016. Um, it was towards the end, but I don't remember exactly what year. Um, but while I was in North Carolina, North Carolina um, instituted agricultural gag laws um, that pro and I read them very carefully because I was doing some field work of my own um, that prohibited um, going into any agricultural operation and misrepresenting why you were there. And so someone like Timothy Pacharat, who went in to a slaughterhouse and got a job like a regular person, but did not tell them that he was a political science PhD student hoping to write his dissertation, 
um, would, would it could have been brought up on charges um, under one of those laws. And so um, a lot of states um, now have those laws in place um, because often what happens is um, and and the the language for those laws often comes from the industry. Um, so they'll write the law, give it to legislatures to get it to move through the system. It works in North Carolina, so they do it somewhere else. Um, and North right. North Carolina was not first, um, but those those laws are in place in a lot of uh, in a lot of U.S. states right now. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if you'll know this one, but someone was wondering how many slaughterhouses in Los Angeles County are Jewish owned. I have no idea. Maybe somebody else knows. No, let us really, know. It is really hard to gather real information about slaughterhouses and those kinds of operations in general. Um, there are places, there are like government run um, websites where you can tell like where they are located because that in and of itself is actually really hard to find out. Um, but yeah, it's it's very hard to find truly accurate and up-to-date and detailed information about slaughter operations. Thanks, Melissa. Um, Adrian, would using robots to pick fruits awesome. and veggies be possible? And what do you think about that? And is this happening already? Um, so there are cases, uh, where big machinery can be used, uh, to harvest crops. Um, it's harder. So often that's happening in, in vegetables. So you can, um, you can use like large scale millions of dollars worth machinery, uh, to harvest corn and some of our, our hardier crops, wheat, um, even, um, I've seen things like, uh, for celery and things like, like your hardier things, um, for fruits, it's really tough because a lot of machinery would bruise the fruit. Um, and so, or the tomato, right. Tomatoes are fruit. Um, and so, um, I'll, almost all fruit is still being hand picked. Um, sometimes for, uh, some of your tree fruits, they'll, they have these machines. Um, I've seen it with like olives, um, where they'll like shake the tree, um, and then, and then things come out. Um, and so that, uh, that might work in some cases, but, um, it, so a lot of what's, so it's, it's, it's the, uh, sensitivity of the fruits itself often, but also that, um, you know, corn grows in a stalk and it's straight up and you can kind of just roll through the field and grab what's on the edges. Um, if you think about just strawberries, right, they're they're buried and the leaves are covering them because they're protecting them. And, and a machine would miss almost as many strawberries it was, as it would be able to pick. Um, I'm sure robots are getting better. I don't, I don't have a lot of information about robot technology. Um, so I feel like it's probably possible, but I think we're not there yet. Got it. Um, do you have any idea how many of your students go vegan after <laughs> taking your course? There's usually a couple a year. Um, a lot of them will, so I would, I should say like students self-select into, so my class is like, it's, it counts for environmental studies and religious studies and Jewish studies. Um, but it's generally an elective. And so a number of vegans and vegetarians self-select into the class. Um, so our vegans and vegetarians at the start. And then I would say a couple a year um, leave the class making different choices than when they started. Um, and I don't do anything to enforce that. The, the, the uh, industry often speaks for itself. Um, what is the motivation or incentive for the government to protect slaughterhouses? <laughs> um, the government does not have a lot of incentive to protect slaughterhouses. So the only incentive is to prevent disease. Um, so often, so the reason that there are safety, um, uh, both health and safety uh, provisions, but also like USDA uh, uh, supervision in slaughterhouses is because of previous outbreaks um, of um, diseases that that are transmitted through animal uh, meat. Um, and so generally what the U.S. is trying to do is prevent people from getting sick um, and and not 
and is not particularly interested in protecting the humans or animals in the plants. Unless it serves yeah. the, the their broader goal of not having meat go onto the shelves that would get people sick. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah. Have um, the gag laws been challenged legally? Yes, but these are private companies. Um, and so private com so a agriculture has again powerful lobbies that can do lots of things. Um, and B, um, even even when the gag laws were not in place, um, private companies have a lot of power to right. They could at the very least sue people uh, for trespassing um, and and for other things. And so, or fraud, right? Um, technically, right? Timothy Pacharat would have lied on his resume to get the job, right? And so they can they can still go after workers um, on their own if they wanted to. Um, and so the ag gag laws help them do that and and generally have scared people away from trying to do undercover work, but the the companies had a lot of power beforehand too. Um this is a good uh, final question. Um, how might you recommend we think about what you teach in terms of what we bring to the table literally at Pesach? What kind of teaching rituals have you adopted yourself, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah. Oh, I change every, I change things every year, but I'll, I'll bring some. Um, so um, I, I am a vegan. And so I would say the first thing is that um, there are not animal products on my um, Seder plate or dinner plates um, during during Passover. Um, and so um, I um, and I and I I know Jeffa talks about this. This is a, a more common thing now. So I'll often replace the egg with flowers for spring. Um, I um, replace the shank bone. Um, I'm, I'm not a big, I know beets are amazing. They're a beautiful color. I know many people love them. I do not enjoy a beet. Um, and so I often replace um, the shank bone with like a sweet potato or something. They have those nice purple sweet potatoes now. Um, and so, um, those are fun. And then, um, there are, so some of the workers, um, um, advocacy orgs, um, have suggested, and I think there's a, I'm trying, I don't know if it's, it might be Trua has a tomatoes on the Seder plate resource, um, for farm workers. So putting some, I usually put some cherry tomatoes on my Seder plate to think about the workers who are still in unjust, uh, uh, working conditions that we might uh, think of as parallel to enslavement um, in many cases. Um, and um, there are, I think, again, this might be true, uh, there's uh, some chocolate resources. And so people will put chocolate on their Seder plates and think about some of those same issues. Um, and in those cases, they're looking for fair trade, um, kosher, fair trade, kosher certified chocolate, um, because um, Especially when we, you know, it, if if we're concerned about the U.S. laws about agriculture, um, certainly um, we should be concerned globally as well. Um, and so a lot of the foods that are produced elsewhere have similar issues. Um, so I, I kind of add things in um, from different places um, and bring all the injustices uh, to the table. Thank you so much. I um there was one really other question and then we've also encouraged people to email us if we weren't able to get to all of them so i think that this is of interest and then we want to end with five minutes to a break before we get to have our next amazing presenter and and this is you know the really fun part where we don't have to learn such difficult stuff although it's so important that we do <laughs> so the final question um before we have our five minute break is can you explain why it's so much more expensive to get kosher the meat kosher in the supermarket um, what what makes the processing of kosher versus non-kosher that creates a huge price difference? Yeah. Um, so a lot of that is um, kosher. So the the plant that Patrat is in that where they're slaughtering a cow every 12 seconds, um, that speed is not possible in a kosher plant um, for if we're thinking about like beef, um, if we're thinking about cows. So um, again, mute me if you um, don't want to hear um, unpleasant things. Um, but um, in a 
non-kosher plant, what they're doing is using a captive bolt stunner, um, which is, which is a, a kind of pistol that has a bullet that goes in and back out um, to render, in theory, the cow unconscious. Um, and then they're um, slitting the throat to, to drain the blood. Um, and so that process um, moves pretty quickly and they're able to do it every 12 seconds. In a kosher plant, um, for for cows, um, they don't use the captive bolt stunner because the animal has to be fully healthy um, at their moment of slaughter. And so what you have is the shochet, the, the slaughterman, um, has to clean the knife, check the knife, sharpen the knife, and perform the cut on a sometimes um, not still animal. Um, and there are complicated things around this. So some uh, plants for a while were using a method called shackle and hoist, um, where they would lift the animal um, by its legs so that they could uh, reach the, the throat easier. That put a lot of undue stress on the animals. And so um, that method is generally not used anymore. Um, but, and so what that means is the rabbi is like underneath, right? So the cow is standing up, the rabbi has to get like underneath, get the right place, cut, and then clean, sharpen, right? And so like that process just takes a lot longer. The lines are slower, um, in the U S so you can't use, um, um, part there's a, there's a whole thing with like, uh, the story of Jacob. Um, and so there's a, there's a, uh, uh, part of the backside of the cow, um, that you can cut around, um, and have it be kosher, but in the U S generally, um, they just, uh, don't use the back half of the animal. And so then there's a cost there that that has to go somewhere else. And so there's a lot of just additional costs, um, and the line is slower. Um, for, for poultry, the line is much slower because um, it's an individual cut where um, for, for non-kosher poultry slaughter, um, they often run chickens uh, into a room um, many at a time um, and, and put them into electric water baths. Um, and so um, the poultry lines are significantly slower um, on the kosher side. Uh, Adrian, so these, thank you these, for, thank just, you for, oh, yep. I just saw this, the, the kosher sounds even more cruel. Uh, there are a lot of studies, uh, so both methods are equally cruel <laughs> and have their uh, pluses and minuses. Sorry. Thank you, Adrian, for being with us today and for teaching us. Um, we're all re rededicated to a, a Passover that's all about liberation. And I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan now. Jonathan, you're on mute. So as Lisa was just saying, Chris Crone, thank you so very much. Really appreciate the work that, that you do and what you brought to us. And look, let's not, let's not kid ourselves. Man, it's hard to hear your stuff. It's, it's hard. Um, and and that's okay, because we need to hear hard things, and we need to bring that awareness of hard things to our Seder tables, to our discussions. You know, we talk about slavery as if it was something in the past, whereas so many of us are supporting industries that are, for all intents and purposes, if not slavery, slave-like. And to be aware of that, to be able to bring the message of liberation that's so to the heart of our our people and to be able to also do so within a context of our dietary choices and the importance that we attach to proper care of the other animals with whom we share this world. It's challenging and it's hard and it's really necessary. And thank you, thank you so much. Um, I can't wait to really, really bug people at my Seder table. Um, with that having been said, we want to just be able to give everyone just a chance to kind of decompress a little bit. In about one minute or so, we're going to be turning things over to Chef Mark. So if everyone just wants to take a breath, we're going to be able to go into cooking preparation and a slightly, you know, as, as, as Lisa said, the fun part, since neither myself nor Professor Crone are considered fun, only Chef Mark shall be fun. <laughs> So we'll just give it, just give it, just give people just 15 seconds. You need to pop, get a, get a quick drink of water or something. Um, and then we will begin um, on the hour exactly. And again, thank you so much, Professor Crown.
I just want to pop on. My name is Brandon. Y'all are doing an amazing job. I've learned a ton today. Thank you for your advocacy and your good work, Yashir Koach. Ah, thank you. And and by the way, if anyone else wants to unmute themselves to tell us how terrific we are and how this great this has been, yeah, I want to encourage you to feel free to do that. But even more importantly, as much as we appreciate the good feedback, if there are things that you're interested in, if there are other elements about Jewish life as it pertains to animal welfare, the work that Jewish Veg does, the work that Jiffa does, please, please, please um, feel free to email us. We'll be sending out information, all sorts of ways to get to us. Your feedback, your input, and, and, and what it is that we can be bringing to all of you is a real important part of our work. And actually, along those lines, before I turn things over to Chef Mark um, and introduce him, um, I just want to mention, since it came up, um, uh, Dr. Crone had mentioned some of the great stuff that Jiffa has on its website. I just want to point people to Jewish Veg website, particularly their Haggadah, uh, which I believe is, is downloadable, is great. Great Haggadah, and want to also point that out to people. Needless to say, we'll be making all of this easy and available to y'all, <laughs> but just wanted to note that as well. Okay, so with that having been said, Chef Mark, are you ready to go? Ready when you are, Rabbi. Okay, so Mark Reinfeld is an award-winning chef, educator, and authority on plant-based cuisine. Chef Mark is the founding chef of the Vegan Fusion Institute with over 25 years of experience preparing innovative vegan and raw food cuisine. He has written eight acclaimed books and conducts virtual and in-person culinary trainings around the world. He's achieved so much. He's had so many different successes and connected in so many different ways that just what I just wanted to point out, my particular favorite thing is that uh, Chef Mark is the recipient of, and I love this award, the Platinum Carrot Award. I, I love that award. I think that's great. And it's a national award given by the Aspen Center for Integral Health to America's top innovative trailblazing healthy gourmet chefs, which is a perfect description of Chef Mark. And a pleasure to be able to share the space with him and have him be our teacher for the next hour. Thank you, uh, Rabbi. Shalom, everybody. And I'm, I'm very excited to share uh, some recipes with you today. Uh, what we heard today has been really amazing and inspirational. And I would consider that the why portion of the, the course we're doing today. And this is the how part of the training. So for whatever reason, if people are wanting to include more plant-based foods into their diet and lifestyle, what I love doing is showing people how easy it is to make the food taste good. And so we all know we could get super pumped up on why to uh, eat more plant-based, but if the food doesn't uh, taste good, it's not going to go very far. So I really love helping people create these long-lasting changes. And so I have a couple of recipes uh, to go over today. Uh, the first is we're gonna do a matzo ball soup. And I know everyone's gonna be getting uh, the recipes. So I'll be talking through it. Uh, so I'm gonna start with the matzo balls, which I have to confess was an enigma to me to get uh, them to come out good uh, vegan. So uh, I'm excited to share this recipe with you. Uh, so it's obviously, it's not gonna have eggs in it. So here I have some matzo meal. Uh, we have some potato starch. And now this is what's gonna act as a, the binder to help uh, help the matzo stay together. In this bowl, I have uh, salt, baking soda, dried parsley, dried dill, pepper, and a little bit of garlic powder. So I'm gonna put this in. We're going to be doing our dry ingredients first, and that's a common practice where you want to mix your dry ingredients well. So here I'm just going to do a little whisk to uh, disperse the ingredients, my dry ingredients. And once that's dispersed, I'm going to be adding some coconut oil. And here I have some sparkling water. And so you could use sparkling water or seltzer is really good. And that helps with uh, aerating the, the matzo balls. I'm gonna just get this mixed together and I'll be showing you 
up close. Let's see a good camera angle. Uh, what the consistency you're looking for. Basically, you want to mix it. And I'm at a, I'm in outside of Boulder, so I'm a little higher altitude. So you may have to adjust the recipe accordingly. But what you're looking for is you want the you want the mixture to be dry, but not uh, slightly moist, but not like uh, too goopy. So your goal is to be able to form, and I'll show you up close here, form the matzo ball so that they hold together nicely. So you're gonna do this, give them a little bit of a roll. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna place it in the refrigerator for about 30 or 45 minutes. And uh, through the magic of TV land, I happen to have my uh, refrigerated matzo balls here. The coconut oil now, uh, I lived in Hawaii for a while. So coconut oil, I always thought was liquid at room temperature, but uh, here in Colorado, I know that it's solid and especially when you refrigerate it. So with that, it's gonna help them hold together. The key thing with the vegan matzo ball is you want it to be able to hold together and you don't want it to be like a rock. So the baking Mark. soda and the, Mark. Uh, yes. Do you mind, if people are asking questions, I, even though I did the other ones after, do you mind if I ask you while they're doing it? Um, yeah, can I, how about I'll do this quick round. I'm gonna put them in the pot and then I'll ask if there's any questions. No problem, perfect. Okay, cool. So again, just uh, nice and solid with the coconut oil in the refrigerator. And then in this pot here, I have simmering water and I added a little bit of salt to it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place, carefully place my matzo balls in the water and just leave it on a gentle simmer. And we'll be, I'm gonna start uh, on the soup portion while this is simmering. And then this would be a good uh, time to ask any questions. Fabulous, sorry, don't wanna, and I know cooking is so much about timing, um, yeah. but um, someone asked if there was an alternative that could be used to coconut oil. And along with that, someone suggested wondering about olive oil and also if leaving the salt out would affect the chemistry for those watching sodium, their sodium. And just for everyone to know, you are all gonna get these recipes as well um, after this presentation. But I'll let you respond to those two things, please. Okay, cool. cool. So coconut oil, I, I haven't tried it with the olive oil. I would be a little hesitant because it doesn't hold its form quite as well. Uh, it's not as solid when it's refrigerated. You could give it a try. Everything in the kitchen, the three top rules for the uh, kitchen is uh, practice, practice, and practice. So I like to say that there's no mistakes in the kitchen. We're always learning. I encourage in my classes like the Thomas Edison approach of just uh, experimenting. So you could try it with the olive oil. If you do have... Um, if you eat chia seeds uh, on Pesach, then I like doing a chia egg to help hold it together. So you could use about a, a tablespoon of chia seeds and three uh, tablespoons of water uh, to replace the coconut oil. Uh, or you could go ahead and try it with, with the olive oil. As far as the salt, uh, you could, uh, without impacting, I mean, it would impact the flavor but it would still hold together and um, you'd still have a nice matzo ball. So you could uh, omit the salt if you wanted to. Thank you. Any other questions on the matzo balls? There was a question, if you're able to do one more, um, about sure. if aqua aquafaba might be able to um, go in instead of the oil and maybe just say what aquafaba is in case others don't know. Sure. So the aquafaba is the... Uh, liquid from a can of chickpeas. Uh, it turns out after all these years, we've been throwing away the wrong part of the can of chickpeas. Uh, that liquid can be used actually as an egg replacer in plant-based cuisine. So you can make a nice meringue 
with it. For these, I would go with the chia seeds and water over the aquafaba. It just has more of a binding effect. But again, I encourage you, you could try it uh, and see, see how it turns out. I wouldn't try it on the day of your uh, Seder, but uh, if you want to try it in advance, you could report back on that. Any other questions? Thank you. That's it for now. Okay, cool. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to get the soup portion ready. Uh, and for your matzo ball soup, it could be as simple as just using a nice uh, plant-based uh, soup stock or bouillon. Uh, here, I'm going to just go over. It's going to be pretty simple of a saute of onion, and then I'll be adding other ingredients as I talk about it. Uh, I did actually do a, I, I have some of the books that the rabbi mentioned I did as a 30 minute vegan. And uh, one of the books is 30 minute vegan soups on. Uh, so I love showing people how to make soups. Uh, I like promoting that book as vegan soups for the chicken soul. Sometimes uh, that joke takes a minute to sink in. But uh, so this is going to be just a simple uh, soup I'm going to get uh, ready for our matzo balls. And then I'll take questions uh, when I complete this stuff. So you could do the soup uh, oil free. Uh, I am going to add a little bit of oil. You could do what's called a water saute of just adding a little bit of water if you wanted to admit, omit the oil. I have my onions in here. I'm going to add a pinch of salt. Uh, and you could also omit that if you're watching your uh, sodium intake. In here, I have uh, celery, mushroom, carrots, garlic, and a bay leaf. So I'm going to include this in our soup here. And then I have our uh, veggie stock. So this could be any of the uh, vegan stocks that are kosher le Pesach in the, in the market, or you could actually just use water. Uh, these ingredients uh, will impart a nice flavor as is. Once the soup is done, I have some fresh dill and ground black pepper. Uh, but I'm going to take the soup now, and I'm just going to uh, let this uh, simmer. Any questions uh, on the soup before I move on to our next dish? So part of my teaching style is what I like to call a template recipe approach. So for a template recipe, what I like to do is show people the underlying formula of a recipe and show them how by changing different components of that formula, they can create a new recipe. So the next stitch I'll show you will be a, a perfect example of that. For our soup here, if you don't like mushrooms, you could leave out the mushrooms. If you like uh, rutabaga or parsnip, you could add that in. That's all gonna enhance the flavor of your soup. And I'm just gonna set this aside here and get our next dish ready. Chef Mark, is there a yeah. vegan stock brand that you recommend? Uh, the Imagine uh, brand has a no chicken uh, broth that's, that's nice that you could use. Uh, there's, there's lots of vegan ones on the market. The, the question is uh, if they're kosher for Passover. So in... Uh, Shopping at Whole Foods here, their their Passover section was like one shelf. So hopefully, where you are, you could, you have more more options than that. And uh, the main dish I'm going to share is it's called a uh, a pecan matzah coconut crusted portobello mushroom. So. Depending on where you stand with uh, eating legumes and grains, like uh, Rabbi spoke about, 
uh, if you're going to eliminate all the grains and legumes, uh, you still want to have some protein coming in. I know that's a big, the big protein myth on a plant-based diet of like where you get your protein. There's actually a ton of plant-based protein sources. Uh, last time I checked the uh, protein deficiency ward in the hospital was empty as usual. So protein on a plant-based diet in our society now is protein deficiency is pretty non-existent. But if you're going to cut out some of the legumes or the higher protein sources, I do think it's just even in terms of satiation, you want to have that. So with our dish here, we're going to be using uh, pecans to get some of that protein. And you could also serve that with quinoa, which is a uh, botanically, it's a seed, but that's also a source of protein. There's going to be three components to this dish. And so this is going to give you a good example of this uh, template recipe approach where one recipe is actually the formula for hundreds and even thousands. Last time I checked, I think it was like 1,357 variations of this recipe. And uh, I heard Rabbi is good at, at math. So maybe you could uh, keep track and let me know if I'm on target with hitting that goal of showing you how many variations are possible. For this, to look at it as a template, instead of calling it like a portobello mushroom as a component, this is gonna be a cutlet. So we're using a portobello mushroom, but you could replace it with eggplant, cauliflower. If you are gonna have tofu or tempeh, you could use that, my favorite way of preparing this dish is actually with like a super firm tofu that you can use. Uh, I always love this when it comes to introducing tofu to people. Uh, this is my go-to dish. Uh, my wife actually makes fun of me for always using this as like a signature dish. And I tell her that if you went to a Led Zeppelin concert, they're always going to play Stairway to Heaven. So not to compare myself to Led Zeppelin, but, uh, I really like, like this dish. So if you are gonna use a portobello mushroom, uh, there's a few things you could do. You could take the stem out. You could use a spoon and uh, take the gills out. Sometimes the gills can get a little bit soggy, which will impact the, uh, the texture. And if you wanna go a step further, you could actually peel the skin off, the outside skin, and this turns it more into like a filet. And so the mushroom will absorb the marinade uh, more that way. Uh, if you wanted to take that extra step, uh, for our purposes, just taking the gills out and I'm gonna leave, leave the top uh, skin on now. So, when I talk about templates, I like this metaphor of uh, spinning wheels on top of each other. So right now we have our cutlet wheel that you could spin with uh, tofu, tempeh, the portobello. I've done it with thick zucchini strips, cauliflower, eggplant. All those can be used as a cutlet. And then the next component is the marinade. And so especially when you're using tofu, tofu is gonna take on the texture, the flavor of what you uh, place in the marinade. So uh, you could get really creative with your marinades. Uh, usually I like using a tamari or a gluten-free soy sauce. I know soy is not uh, used by many over Passover. So I did, this is more like a lemon, uh, lemon uh, marinade. Uh, the recipe has you combining all these ingredients in a bowl. I'm just going to drizzle it on here. I have some lemon juice and water. Uh, that could be uh, lime juice. I have a little olive oil here. Uh, you could do this uh, oil free if you wanted to. And then I have salt, pepper. Uh, I know cumin is one of my favorite. I call it one of my desert island spices. If I were stuck on a desert island, cumin would make it pretty much on the top of spices. But if you're not using cumin, you could use uh, smoked paprika, which I have here. 
and I'm going to show you up close. So I just drizzled this, the, the lemon juice, the oil, the seasonings, and then you could toss it a little bit. Uh, and then we're going to put it in the oven, uh, gill side up. We're going to bake it for about 10 minutes. And then we're going to flip it, bake it for another 10 minutes. And then, voila. If you're lucky, uh, it'll turn out something like this. So I have our two portabellas uh, ready here. So I'm gonna set that aside. This will probably be our dinner later tonight. And now we have uh, our cutlet. So there's two, two other components to this dish now. And this is where the rabbi's math skills are gonna get challenged because there's there's hundreds of, of variations for this. And I will talk about that shortly, but any questions on what I've done so far with the portobello mushroom? I don't have any in the chat. Okay, cool. So uh, there's two other components to this dish right now. One is gonna be the crust. Uh, and so for the crust, this is where there's an opportunity for lots of variations. So here I have uh, chopped pecans and some crumbled matzah. Uh, you can replace the pecans with really any nut or seed. So it could be pistachio nuts, uh, macadamia nuts, cashews, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds. You could do half pumpkin seed, half walnut. You could do all those different variations to give different flavor profiles to your dish. To this base mixture, I'm gonna be adding, I have some dried coconut and uh, living in Hawaii, I lived in Hawaii for many years. So I'm very, uh, very fond of using uh, coconut. Coconut, salt, pepper, crushed red pepper flakes smoked paprika and dill. And so if you break this down, the crust into a template, you have your seed or nut component, which I talked about how many variations you can make. This, I, I use smoked paprika, but I would call that the global spice component. And so in my classes, one of the big tips when people want to start learning how to incorporate more healthy foods in their diet is, go into creating a global spice blend. So you could make your own or purchase them. Then you have your Mexican, Italian, Ethiopian, Moroccan, Cajun spice blends that just with the flick of your hand, this could be an Ethiopian pistachio portobello mushroom or a Mexican sunflower cauliflower steak just by changing that up. Uh, we have fresh dill which I would say is the, the fresh herb component. So I'm a big fan of uh, fresh dill. We'll be using it in our matzo ball soup. So that's why I selected it for this dish, but that could be cilantro, basil, parsley, or a combination of your favorites. So I have our crust mixture right here. Any questions on the crust mixture? There is a question. If not during Passover, would you still use the uh, matzah or what would you do differently? Uh, I would just leave the matzah out. I like doing like macadamia coconuts, probably my favorite, but uh, you could just leave it out or add additional uh, nuts or seeds if you're following the recipe. And... Thank you. And the, another Good. question is, would there be time modifications if you're uh, swapping in another vegetable or tofu? And can you think of a substitute for coconut, please? Uh, so you could uh, leave out the coconut if you don't like coconut uh, and the recipe stands uh, fine on its own. It's just having a nut or seed blend. You could use uh, hemp seeds if you wanted to. 
for a nice uh, flavor and texture, but you could leave out the coconut as well. And uh, the cooking time, that's a great question. So at this stage, because basically what we're gonna do is I'm gonna uh, show you how to make a spread that's gonna go on the mushrooms and then we're gonna put our crust on it. So at this stage, and that's only gonna be for another 10 minutes or so in the oven. At this stage, you want whatever you're cooking to be like just tender. So with tofu, uh, I, I cook it for about 10 or 15 minutes at this stage and then another 10 minutes uh, after the crust is on. Once you put the crust on, you just wanna be careful not to burn it. Chef, I have a yeah. question um, about yeah. the coconut. Um, is it yeah. coconut flakes? It looks almost powdery in the uh, They were, it was coconut, shredded coconut, but you could use the coconut flakes as well. And you want it to be unsweetened. Okay. That would be a, I, I like saying there's no mistakes in the kitchen. Uh, if you use the sweetened coconut, you'd be pushing the limits of that statement. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, cool. So uh, now traditionally what's used to get a crust to stick to a cutlet oftentimes is uh, an egg wash that's used in mainstream cooking. My favorite to use is tahini, but I know that's a lot of people aren't using tahini during Passover. So you could use like an almond butter or even a peanut butter. Uh, uh, when you follow this recipe. So I have that becomes like the seed or nut butter component. So you could tahini, almond butter, cashew butter, peanut butter, uh, rotate through. Uh, this is a little, uh, some lime juice here. And then I have uh, salt, pepper, and my smoked paprika. That again could be a different uh, global spice blend. Uh, one of the things I like to point out in my classes is how uh, even with the same ingredient, there could be a wide range of texture and flavor for uh, the same ingredient. So some tahinis, for instance, or like a traditional tahini would be nice and uh, creamy and slightly sweet and a nutty flavor. Some is a little more bitter. Uh, so the amount of water that you add at this stage when you're following the recipe will vary depending on the, the brand of uh, almond butter or tahini that you're using. Uh, there's an interesting property with tahini when you add water to it is that it initially seizes up. You'd think it would water it down but it actually uh, makes it thicker. And then you have to add more uh, water to get your desired consistency. And this would be our, our spread. Does anyone have any questions on this component of the dish? Good. I don't see any. Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna mix this up a little bit here. The next step is we're gonna take our, and I'll show this up close. The first step is we're gonna take a good amount of our spread and we're just gonna be doing the, the top portion. I, I find that uh, I usually don't do the top and bottom with like the heavy nut base crust. It's pre pretty, uh, it gets a little heavy, so I just use one side, just the top, and I'll show you this step. So here, uh, this is also going to give you some more of that protein uh, as part of your dish. And then we're going to take our crust. and sprinkle this on top. And I'll show you this up close again too. Now this is something that you could, uh, if you wanted to prepare this earlier in the day for your Seder, this is something you could safely do 
earlier in the day. And then I would just give it a reheat uh, right before you serve. And I'll just show you this. So you're entering the world of a uh, gourmet plant-based cuisine. Uh, once you start doing this, I'm gonna show you how to make a nice pesto to go on top of it. But uh, this is the mushroom. It's gonna go in the oven at this point for another 10 minutes. And uh, we'll actually do that. Any questions on that portobello mushroom? Um, what degree is the oven? Uh, the recipe has it at, at uh, 370, at 400. Okay, thank you. And for tofu or other substitute vegetables that don't have like the cup, the way the mushroom does, um, how does the topping um, stay in place when you're baking it or any other uh, suggestions to applying the topping? Uh, it That's what the tahini or almond butter uh, crust does. It really holds on nicely. Like I mentioned, uh, my favorite is to use it with like a super firm tofu. Lisa? Um, yeah. Chef, Chef Mark, um, it yes. looked to me like when you said top, it looked to me like what I would call the bottom. Like what were you putting yeah. in, in the cavity or on That's the dome? Yeah, that's a good, thank you. Yeah, top meaning uh, the top of the mushroom, but once it's laid in the dish, but it would be on the inside of the, the gill side. Okay. So you're, you're starting it gill side up when you roast it, then gill side down, and then you bring it back to gill side up. So it's in the cavity, like, like you said. Okay, okay, thanks. Sure. So, uh, Pesto is another, it's one of my favorite uh, dishes to prepare. Uh, I like referring to this as a, a template recipe as well. What I'd like to, I call like an herb puree. And so traditionally pesto has basil, uh, but we're gonna be using parsley. You could use cilantro, you could use a mixed herb blend, which is nice in the springtime with some dill. Uh, just a, a mixed herb blend. Uh, traditionally, it uses pine nuts, but you could use uh, any nut or seed. I've done it with cashews, macadamia nuts, pecans, pistachios, and those nuts could, or seeds could be uh, raw or toasted. And a toasted pecan pesto will taste different than a raw pecan pesto. So that's where you can get a lot of variation uh, in your dish there. Uh, traditionally, then there's lemon juice. I have salt, pepper, uh, crushed red pepper flakes. I'm using olive oil. You could definitely do this oil free. Uh, I like using uh, avocado if I'm gonna do an oil free pesto. Uh, and then I have a uh, nutritional yeast, which I'm using, which some people may not use during Passover, but uh, nutritional yeast. Usually in my classes, I'm always constantly asking questions, but I'm just gonna do my soliloquy. So nutritional yeast uh, is also in some circles referred to as hippie dust. Uh, it's a key ingredient in the plant-based pantry. A lot of the ingredients and techniques we use, they have both a nutritional component and a culinary component. So with nutritional yeast, it's giving you uh, plant-based protein, B vitamins and B12 if it's fortified. And as for the culinary side, it gives you a, a nutty and cheesy flavor. So uh, I'm gonna add that here. I'm putting my, uh, the, the cashews, the parsley. I personally like putting a little bit of uh, green or red onion in with my uh, pestos. Here's my salt, pepper, and crushed red pepper flakes. I like giving a little bit of a bite to it. 
Excuse me, chef. Yes. Um, is that Italian, you know, flat parsley? Yes, I typically only use the flat leaf parsley. Thank you. And I'm going to be using a, a mini food processor to process it. You could also use a blender. When do you think uh, you use a blender and when do you use a food processor? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, use the food processor. Tuesday, Thursday, every other Sunday, the blender. Just kidding. So with the uh, the food processor, the blender gives you a finer, uh, smoother consistency, but you need more liquid to get that consistency. So I like doing pestos in the food processor. So I'm just gonna process this up now. With the, uh, when you're using a food processor, one of the techniques is you wanna have a spatula on hand or a scraper and uh, move the ingredients from the side to the center of your uh, face here. So I'm gonna just process this up here. You could add more, uh, with pesto, what I love about pesto is you could add more or less oil to get the consistency you want. It could be like a nice, like a, almost like a spread, or you could thin it out to serve it over uh, pasta. I'm just gonna... that, that is our pesto. I'm gonna use that to top our uh, portobello mushrooms, but uh, any questions on the pesto? Okay, so I'm gonna check out, we're gonna check out our matzo ball soup now. I have our soup here. I'm just gonna add those final ingredients, the dill and the black pepper into the soup. I'll show you this once it's in the bowl. And then I think Lisa referred Oh, any question? There was one question. If you were doing this with tofu, would you uh, would you press the tofu and try to get the liquid out of it first? So great question. Uh, I love using uh, the super firm tofu, which doesn't really require uh, pressing. Uh, with tofu, there used to be it used to be just uh, soft, medium, and firm. Uh, then they had extra firm, and then only in the US, never to be outdone, we have the super firm. So the super firm is also called a high protein. And you could try pressing it, but you don't get much liquid out. If you're using like an extra firm, that's when I would, uh, that's when I would press it. And so here's uh, the matzo ball. It would probably benefit from a little bit more cooking to know if it's ready, these actually aren't quite done. You wanna simmer this for about 30, 35 minutes. You could see it's a little dry still in the center. Uh, that gets cooked through, but you could see it has a nice like texture on the outside here. Uh, and they're not as dense as the other uh, vegan matzo balls I've, I've tried. I'll just show you some, uh, I'm gonna show you some plating on um, the soup and the mushrooms and then I'll take any any last questions. Just pull that out here. That. So uh, plating and presentation is, is really important to me uh, when I do, uh, whenever I serve people food. So I always like having garnishes set aside. I'll talk more about that when I do the plating of the mushrooms but, uh, for the soup. So the recipe has you uh, adding the matzo ball to, this, uh, to the soup and letting it uh, cook for about uh, five minutes or so. I don't recommend 
having these matzo balls uh, sit around for a long time. They will, I, I personally like, like the flavor of them, but they'll get more dense if you have it uh, sitting around for too long. So I'm just gonna put some fresh dough there. You always wanna, if you have time, wipe the side of your plate before you serve. This would be a huge faux pas if I tilted this over too much. Uh, but that's our matzo ball soup with just a little fresh dill kind of brightens it up there. And then plating for the, for the mushroom, I have some dill, some uh, cherry tomatoes and some black sesame seeds, which is like a signature, uh, signature, uh, item my food that I use for my presentation. Uh, there's lots of different ways to do uh, plating. Uh, in my, I do a four week training and I, we go over a lot of like uh, food plating and presentation. Uh, I give students a plating kit. Uh, this is called uh, the schmear technique. I'm just doing like a little bit of the, the sauce and uh, kind of sliding it on the plate. I have my mushroom here. And uh, again, this, this would be nice. I think of uh, having some uh, quinoa would balance it out nicely. Uh, you could, I like serving it with like a roasted asparagus. Do this here. It's gonna, so use uh, when you're doing plating for others, using uh, plating tools is nice. And uh, I'm gonna actually put another little dollop the, the mushroom here. And then do this here. I like doing this in slow motion. If you could slow down the camera just a little sprinkle of the black sesame seeds. Uh, if you do have them for Passover, I love how it pops the color, especially with like the reds and the yellows and oranges. So that's what I have for everybody today uh, on the kitchen side of things. If there's, I'm happy to take any questions uh, about introducing plant-based foods into your Passover, any questions you have about uh, plant-based cuisine in general. That was amazing and looks so delicious. And um, thank you so much. You also just did it so well. It was so, so easily understandable. Looks oh, good. Cool. Um, so if people have questions about other egg substitutes or things like that, this is your chance. Um, and then I did get a question. You had mentioned not to let the matzo balls cook too long or soak too long because they get denser. So someone was asking, what do you recommend if, if um, you want to make them in advance of the Seder? How would you still have them stay that light um, the way they are right now? I would, uh, you could make them and keep them in the refrigerator the day before, I would say the time in the refrigerator could be longer, but I would time it so that you're, you're cooking them in the in the, the water i find putting a little salt in helps with the flavor putting them in the soup and then serving them that would be my uh recommendation for that thank you chef yes won't you be my neighbor <laughs> <laughs> certainly <laughs> wonderful presentation looks delicious thank you so I do like, uh, I mean, for me, I, I'm really excited to be part of this presentation because like uh, the the speakers before me, this idea of like kashrut and just like the idea of compassion and sensitivity, both to the workers and the animals. Like I do feel like I, I've written some articles for Reform Judaism as uh, vegan is the new kosher. And I feel like the more we can include 
this in the, our, into our lifestyle, the more we're like honoring our, our traditions. So I'm excited to show people how if you do feel a similar way and you want to have your Seder and your meals reflect those values that there are lots of ways for you to do that without compromising on flavor or satiation and still getting the sense of what we always look for in those traditions, like that sense of home and comfort. And I'm getting a lot of private chats about how no one has ever successfully not had their vegan matzo balls fall apart. This is what you and I were talking about two weeks ago. So yeah, these won't fall apart. Us to, to not yeah. have matzo balls that fall apart because that's so disappointing for all of us. Where I know a lot yeah. of us are really excited to try it. <laughs> cool. Uh, let's see. So uh, I could. I have a some other talking points I could go over if we have time or if you guys have other things that you wanted to move on to. We'd love to hear any of your wisdom uh, as cool. long as there are not questions coming in. Okay, so I, I always like to share, it's something I call like the three doors and they're the reasons why people choose to include more plant-based foods into their diet or lifestyle. Uh, all of these doors uh, go into the same room. And so the three doors uh, for me are the, the health or medical door, which based on all my years of doing classes, that's definitely the largest number of people coming, wanting to make change or coming through that door. There's also the environmental and sustainability door. Uh, and then there's a, what I like to call the concern for animal welfare, or I would call like the ethical or animal rights door. They all go into the same room. There's a ton of reasons for all of them. It's interesting because each of those doors has like a different energetic charge to it. If you're at a table with a mixed crowd and they say, why are you eating plant-based? And you say, it's for my health. Everyone still keeps eating. Uh, if you say it's for the environment, there might be some mild curiosity, like an eyebrow might raise somewhere. And then uh, if you say it's for the animals, that's where like, pandemonium ensues and the chandelier is flying and the crystals are falling off the table. So it's just interesting for me, having been doing this for so long to see how that lands differently with people. But as far as door number one, a lot of the major health challenges that we face as a society, heart disease, diabetes, high cholesterol, certain forms of cancer, inflammation, there's more and more evidence that these conditions can be prevented and reversed on a plant-based diet. Uh, as far as door number two, when you look at the environmental impact of our food choices, you could see that it takes a fraction of them to uh, on a plant-based diet to feed humanity. And until we colonize Mars, like this planet is all that we have. So I feel it behooves us to consider the impact that our food choices have on the environment. And as far as door number three, I think we we touched on that to see just how compassion and concern for animal welfare could lead us uh, in, into the room. Once you get in the room, uh, then you could learn about these other reasons and they could form part of your, your own personal philosophy. Thank you for sharing that about the doors. Um, we also did get, um two questions in the chat um, more about food as well. So um, any dessert ideas you have? And then um, is there a vegan Passover cake was the second question. So, uh, yeah, so it depends on where you stand with, uh, I mean, for me personally, like using uh, the chia seeds uh, or because, so the egg is a big, when it comes to like desserts and vegan baking, uh, eggs play a role in that. So if you use like a chia, you could look at a traditional Passover recipe and replace each egg with uh, one tablespoon of chia seeds and three tablespoons of water. And in most cases that works uh, in the, in the plant-based realm. Uh, I like to do, you could do like a sweetened matzo brai. Uh, also using, if you want to use a, uh, chia and uh, water to replace uh, the egg. Uh, if you are going to use, uh, there's a product called Just Egg, which is uh, mung bean based. So if you're having mung beans, uh, 
that's something that I would recommend. You can make an amazing uh, matzo brai with that. Uh, and then you can make like a, I like making like a sweetened cashew cream. So you could make basically one of the main culinary techniques that I like to show people is making a cashew cream. It's really versatile. You could go from like all the way for the sweet desserts to like savory, like plant-based cheeses and sour creams. So basically just uh, soak raw cashews, uh, drain them. You always wanna drain the water when you're soaking them and then add water to uh, and blend it to get to like a creamy consistency. And the amount of water you add will depend on the strength of your blender. Uh, and then you could sweeten it to taste. So if you could use like, if you wanna keep it nice and white, you can use like an agave nectar or, cane or sugar to keep it sweet and white. My favorite uh, sweet spice combo is cinnamon and cardamom. So I like doing a sweetened cardamom cashew cream like that. And then you could serve it on the matzo brai, a sweet matzo brai, or just even over fresh, uh, fresh berries. You can make like a nice uh, parfait using that. So th those are some, uh, just off the top of my head, some uh, dessert ideas. Thank you so much, delicious. Um, and really quickly, it's it's ground chia you're talking about, right? Well, you could use whole chia seeds. So I guess on the, the OU website, they do allow uh, chia seeds, but not ground chia seeds. So the flax seeds, if you have flax seeds, those you wanna use ground, that was my go-to for many years. And I actually like using that. I use it interchangeably, but you could use ground flax seeds and water or whole chia seeds and water. Thank you. And then finally, do you have a favorite cookbook to recommend for Passover vegan recipes? Ooh, uh, Passover vegan, I would just look it up online. There's a lot of free uh, resources out there for vegan Passover recipes. That would be my my suggestion. You may come upon some of mine. I've done some for like reformjudaism.org. I had a some uh, vegan Passover recipes there. Thank you so, so much, Chef Mark. Cool. This was amazing. I'm going to okay. let Jonathan hop in now to help us close up. But thank you. This was delicious. I can't wait to yeah. make these. Thank you guys for having me. <clears throat> Yashika. Uh, thank you, Chef Mark. Uh, thank you, Professor Crone. Thank you so much for your learning um, and, and all that you brought to us. Um, I don't know about the rest of you. I am famished right now. I am absolutely <laughs> starving. A um, little bit easier for me. It's one o'clock for those of you at different time zones. I know the next meal is a little bit kind of in between, but I'm going to go have some lunch right now. So I really appreciate that. Um, but really, so, so grateful for the learning um, and grateful for all of you for coming to attend, to be a part of this. Um, those of you who popped in for one session, those of you who stayed for all three, all of it, we're so grateful to be able to share with you. And we will continue that sharing um, as afterwards we'll be sending out an email with recipes, um, links to the various uh, slides and websites and the other material that we presented. Um, again, thank you all very much. We hope that this will help elevate and make your Passover Seder um, and your Passover holiday all the more deep and meaningful and inspire you to go out and do the work that we all need to do to make this a more compassionate world. Thank you so very, very much, everyone. Amen.